Welcome to the Creativity Theory Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Smith, and today I am joined by my good buddy and brother in Christ, Johnny Gray. That's me. Yep, yep. Um, Johnny and I met about a little over 10 years ago doing comedy down at Nut Street. Yeah. We became friends uh, through, well, I mean, through comedy, I suppose, but it was more you got caught wind of me doing camboy stuff and invited me to be part of the Kukaloris Film Festival in mm. 2014. That was the first year I got to be involved. That's right. Because you were running the visual sound walls, and I definitely want to get into talking more about that later on. Um, but, uh, yeah, ever, ever since then, you know, uh, our conversations have become very creative and philosophically oriented towards creativity and attempts at collaboration and um lots of lots of good fun friendly history between the two of us this is one of my best buddies right here if you ever heard me mention hey this isn't my car i'm driving this is my friend johnny <laughs> the car That's me i've been renting it from him he's been living in hawaii for the past four years He's back. I'm back, baby. At least for right now. I don't know if he's going back to Hawaii. Maybe I'll find out. Maybe he'll tell me. Yeah. All in this week's episode of the Creativity Theory Podcast. Nice. And Johnny, before we get into it, mm -hmm. I just got to read an ad. Okay. Yeah, please. <clears throat> this is exciting. All right. Let me pull this thing up here. Let me know if I can, I can assist in sales. I can barely see my mouse. Okay, here we go. Today's episode of the Creativity Theory Podcast is brought to you by Raisins. And that uh, there's just no more. It's just it's brought to you by Raisins. I don't know if it's a specific brand or just Raisins in general, but... That's amazing. I love Raisins. Do you? Yeah. You know, I'm, I don't think I like them all that much. I do like dates i've been eating some medjool dates oh yeah with butter in it oh you ever like had a, that like a nut butter no no no. just taking like an actual just like grass-fed butter oh just taking a little chunk slicing open a big date okay. just sticking a chunk of butter in there dude it's so good i ain't never done that kind of tastes like a pancake okay they call them pancake bites well that's good marketing for that yeah right there yeah i should have done a commercial for that <laughs> oh maybe next episode yeah Medjool Dates, sponsor me. Yeah, sp sponsor this guy. Come on. Well, oh. Johnny. Oh, okay. Welcome back to the United States of America. I know you were basically in the Middle East. That's what Hawaii is part of. Is that right? That's correct, yes. One of the one of the little-known islands of the Middle East. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good to be back in America, even though it felt like America before. Mm -hmm. Some people even call it America, but pretty different also yeah well do you want to tell us a little bit about let's start with the hawaii trip okay i just want to just go straight into that um first what led you to make that decision to go to hawaii because <laughs> at first the decision it was uh to go do one of these uh work in exchange for living situations right yeah and right. you've done that before in different places. Yeah. Um, so you were not expecting when you went there that you would be there for four years. Right. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a six month, six month situation. And it just kept on going, kept on feeling right. And that is one of the mindsets in a lot of the Hawaiian friends that I've made that uh, you just kind of go with the flow. I just kind of got this thing going on, the flow, and it felt good sticking around. And I was doing a lot physically in, in nature and building and uh, dancing. Hmm. <laughs> it's another physical activity I did quite a bit there. Um. But I guess getting back to your question of why I went there, mm. I had been living in this town that we're in right now, Wilmington, for 18 years. Mm. And it seemed like it was time to, to see some other places. 
Mm-hmm. And I never really lived any other place besides North Carolina. And <clears throat> the idea I got was to travel around in my SU vehicle, which you're driving mm-hmm. right now. And I would do a lot of sleeping in this thing and living out of it and, and going various places out west, the western part of this country that I'd never been before. And sometimes I would have friends that I would go visit at these various places. And sometimes people would just tell me about a spot and I would just go there and check it out. And I was doing that for about a year Hmm. of, yeah, I just had it where I had a little bit of passive income, uh, just enough to make it, make it work where I could do this exploration. And then a friend of mine wanted me to go on a vacation with her and mentioned Hawaii as one of the options. Another option being Portugal that we were heavily considering. And we chose Hawaii, the big island. And I set it up to do this work trade thing there and just kept doing it. I kept running into situations uh, that seemed like good, interesting living situations. Mm-hmm. A lot of it being a work trade or house sitting. But then I got into community living and uh, living slash working at these retreat centers and also doing the car living thing there as well sometimes. Hmm. Sometimes just living in the jungle for a little bit. Yeah. And it got me a little more in touch with nature, which uh, I believe... Is you know we're talking about creativity mm-hmm. on this podcast, and to me, uh, creation is is God. Yeah, I and, think I agree with that. And uh, that's good. We're agreeing right off the bat. Uh huh. We're not is, not an argument. This, this is, is not an argument episode. This <laughs> so is great. Far. So far, so good. And yeah, with that, the you know it seems like the the biggest creator undeniably is, is nature. Mm. So that would be, I love thinking about, I love trying to explain everything or, you know, explain, explaining the unexplainable. Yeah. Explain mm. this weird ass existence mm-hmm. that we're in. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot lately and the, uh, the, this idea of what is, what is God? Mm hmm. And to me, undeniably, it's it's three things, mm. and maybe maybe one day a fourth thing. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this okay if we get into this? Yeah. Well, I wanted to, um, and maybe this. I feel like this is prob- probably aligned with this because it was the question I asked you the other day that we decided to save for the podcast. Mm-hmm. But it was your experience. I mean, you know, you can talk about that lifestyle, the way you were living in Hawaii is like more like a nomad kind of lifestyle. It was like semi homeless at times. Mm-hmm. But then again, you were like in nature and it was a voluntary sort of <laughs> homelessness. Yeah. And um, and so this is comes with getting in touch with nature. And I think getting closer to some sort of... Um, understanding of of what we're talking about here god and creation these sort of things start to make sense more the more in touch with it you you get yeah more you get rid of the distractions so i wanted to talk to you about like being on a prolonged adventure like that is this what you would say is your biggest takeaway is just this sort of realization about the nature of existence it's pretty huge yeah and it's it's funny you mentioned homelessness. I would like to mention that yeah that is that is a pretty challenging situation to be in where you're where you're living in your in your vehicle or even if you don't have that that's even more so. Uh, but also, it was so amazing. 
Yeah. The We were in Hawaii. I was in Hawaii, <laughs> which adds to it. Yes. Um, I imagine being in the same situation in New York might be a little bit different. It'd be different. Yeah. yeah. Or even around here. It's got to be. Yeah. Right. It's very location specific to how good it can be. Yeah. I wouldn't say the guy down there on the corner, like third and chestnut is necessarily getting in touch with nature. <laughs> Well, it's pretty weird that it's it's pretty hard to get in touch with nature. Yeah. Um, around here. Yeah. And I, I guess in general, if you don't have, if you're not shelling out the dough to own your own part of God, nature God, mm -hmm. which is such a, a strange aspect of what we've got going on in this existence, if if we can agree that nature is God mm. and we've got this other entity or this idea that's limiting access to it, yeah, which would be essentially government owning all of nature. God. Yeah. By the way, real quick. I mean, I imagine you probably have a long, like long winded explanation for why mm. it's each of these three things, but what are the three things that you see? Are oh, God? So yeah, the three things would be, nature mm. and the individual mm. are so 8 billion gods or whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> however many they may be, you know, cause we got this perspective that's shooting out of our skull. Mm -hmm. Um, and the third would be the interaction between mm. the individual God and nature God. Mm. So it can be anything you and I create together any seeds we plant, mm -hmm. any uh, prunings or mulchings or uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. shelters we might build out of the, what we have in our existence yeah. to work with. and uh, So, so you feel like it's limited to nature, human beings, and then the relationship between nature and human beings? I think so. That's the, that's the sense I'm getting. I suppose that, that makes sense in the context of seeing the word God as a human concept to divide it in relation to that which is human, that which is not not human, mm. and but that which, I guess, in cases and in, is the environment of, of a human. Yeah. Because um, I think... We're not disagreeing. <laughs> but, we, better, we better not. Yeah, we better not. <laughs> um, but I think I, I think I feel similarly. I think I would just identify God rather than three things as like this abstract force, like an abstraction mm. of, of what you're saying. It's a specific, and it's hard to pen down with words, but I see God as when you take human human beings nature all that's within nature and the universe and beyond yeah it's this abstract pattern or this force of positive creation like divine order yeah. it's the things that like you know if you look at the universe and in, in this entropy perspective where it's a bunch of chaos and explosions and, and wild stuff going on it's very dangerous yeah um and disorderly it's all the divine order that just occurs out of that in spite of all the chaos yeah and so that's like it's i think god points to the fact that from a scientific perspective it seems really crazy and odd that the planet earth even exists and operates as it does right and it's like a really lucky chance inside of scientific entropy that, uh -huh. that we human beings can exist and are what we are and even have the perspective that we do and can have that relationship with nature. Um, yeah. So I guess that's, that's a little more way I see that, that, but I, I like, I like how you've divided it into these three things and I want to hear more about like why you think that and um, how your experience brought you to, to see it that way. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not attached to any of these ideas, but, uh, it seems, oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I can let go of it. Yeah. Change your mind and believe what I believe. Cause I just um, said it. <laughs> uh, 
Well, so you're 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 believing or you're saying that it's it's the it's the force. It's the it's the force. Mm -hmm. Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Star Wars guy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this this un, unseen force that is creating and destroying, which is also creating, which I think is a fun thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, destruction is a form of creation. Yeah, and yeah, I guess I'm I'm breaking it down to, and I guess in a way this this helps me come to terms with the hypocritical discussion that I, mm. I I have in my myself between the idea that there is some sort of divine plan mm -hmm. and also that us individuals have free will mm. and so if it can be seen that way and that there's that there's this God that's mm -hmm. all around us that is this nature, this existence mm -hmm. that we, we just happen to find ourselves in and that also we are God. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, that helps me a little bit come to terms with, okay, I've got this free will, but I'm also interacting in this thing that has some sort of a divine plan involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so this collaboration if uh, you know we're working together, these two gods, we can create who knows what amazing stuff. When then in this third mm. god category, yeah, <laughs> of collaboration. Well, so I like here's here's why I really like that we agree on the god, like seeing God and creativity is like somewhat synonymous, mm. is because um, I. I don't know if I agree with the idea that we as humans are God, but I do believe that we are of God mm. or that the bit of us that, that, mm. that it like we have part of God, like the part of God that's in us is synonymous with creativity. Like there is mm. divine creation, which is of course the creation of everything. Mm -hmm. But then there is human creativity, which is what human beings in their limited form are capable of doing creatively in mm -hmm. that limited form. So there's divine creativity, God, and then mm -hmm. human creativity. And it's that creativity, even in the human form, that is a little bit, that's a little piece of God that we have. Yeah. That's, that's how I kind of see it. And there's... Can, um, I, can I alter what, I'm, what I've said? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. That? Uh, that we are God of our ourselves, of our own. Yeah, experience. of our domain, of our, our 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 limitation. Right. The way we can look at a situation and be like, "Oh, this sucks," or mm -hmm. instantly change it and be like, "This is awesome." Right. It's that free will and capacity for creativity that is. That's what our little chunk of God that we have. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Please go ahead. <laughs> oh no! And I well, I was just saying this whole um. And this kind of gets into some creative philosophy stuff too, but um, you know, there's this. Uh, I think it's a Jewish idea that uh, circumcision. <laughs> no, oh, not that one. I know you love that topic, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's that. What is the one thing that man has that God does not? Mm. Limitation. Oh, okay. yeah. And so then I like that idea in line with a lot of um, what I've learned not, or a lot of like creative philosophy stuff I've heard about, like our limitation is what makes us like helps people be creative. Like the more like, you know, people really want freedom in creativity. That's often talked about. Like I just want pure creative freedom. Mm. But it's oftentimes where you have these specific limitations, whether those are you are a broke person and you really can't do things that someone with a budget can do with creativity. So you're limited to focus on your resources. And because your mind can't go outside of that domain, you end up doing really interesting things with what little you have. Same with like, you know, you're working for a, a news network or a, a television network that like you can't do this, this and this on the television network. So whatever you are allowed to do, you're playing with those rules and you end up finding really creative ways to get around them or 
play with the rules. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, was just thoughts that were coming up there when we were talking about God, creativity, and limitation. All right. And, Which is its own way of creating and can promote, mm-hmm. you know, maybe not better or worse, but whatever is going to pr- create something different. Yes. The creation of parameters and boundaries. Yeah. 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 Uh, which is so fun to think about, you know, if, as if you are God, if Cameron Smith is God and, mm-hmm. I am. and has, and you are, <laughs> and you have unlimited resources. And I'm, I'm curious about this for you in general, unlimited resources to create whatever you want. Mm. You know, what are, what are you going to create? Hmm. Like, yeah, if, if someone were to wave a magic wand and then I just had an unlimited amount of money, like, what would I start doing right now? All the, all the money, all the time, all the, the people that want to help you. Well, I'd stop doing this podcast, number one. Right. <laughs> just, you know, I'd definitely continue. I'd finish this out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at least finish just this, this episode. This I would, interview. I would finish this episode and then I would go work on allocating labor to other people like i would pay a team to be my editor and then distributors so i just record this and then pass the footage on to someone else yeah i probably, probably don't even have to plug anything yeah, in right You're probably gonna. i probably go invest in a studio mm-hmm. and um a, like an actual crew so where i don't even have to pass the footage along there's physically people here that are shooting it <laughs> with <Yeah>. nicer cameras <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> maybe even a uh, zoom h nine <laughs> man whenever the they next, put that out the next step up um but then i yeah i think i would definitely focus on comedy making music and film projects and um you know i, I don't want to talk about it on here because i'm still trying to keep it on the dl but the documentary no. project um that that would probably be like the main thing i focus on while trying to work on some new music and comedy as sort of a secondary thing and then doing this also in my free time because i do like having the conversations but uh it is quite a uh time consuming thing right to do all the editing and distribution and stuff like that all right hand editing all three of these cameras Mm -hmm. yeah 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 i don't even know if people paying attention to this knows what the amount of time that goes into cutting these YouTube videos. Yeah. So that, that's what I would do with nice. money. So basically the stuff you're already doing, stuff I'm already doing that I, looking for money is distracting. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Looking for money really distracts me from, from that. Yeah. yeah. I would probably continue doing modeling photography for fun. Yeah. I like doing that. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Chasing the joy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I might get into painting and actually playing instruments. Those are some other things I'd probably do if I had that extra time. Nice. Yeah. Might travel some. Mm hmm. These are all, these are all good things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that happens. (laughs) I hope it does too. What about you? What would you do if you suddenly were free of the financial burden? Hmm. Well, I would be real careful to uh, not let that destroy me <laughs> uh, <laughs> or ho- hope, hope not to uh, because it can get, I imagine, pretty lethargic if uh, you just got everything you need and don't have that, that drive specifically to... Yeah. I do wonder about that because, you know, the first week of the pandemic, like the first couple months of the pandemic, I was not getting financial relief. Like my, uh, unemployment application was just like frozen Mm. and it took like two months before they finally were like, Oh, okay. Yeah. We owe you all this money. And then they gave it to me all at once. But for those first two months, that was most productive. I was in the pandemic. Like I I was, I thought I was fucked. And yeah, that's when I made Camrona virus in one week. Yeah, and then took maybe a week break, and then the following three weeks made the Bad Boy album. Nice, and yeah, I had, I was not financially okay. I I had no idea what was going to (laughs) happen, but um, that was fueling creativity towards these other projects. I mean, yeah, I guess it was. I mean, you know, special circumstances. One of it being like the first few weeks, it was 
kind of this, um, no one knew what to believe about the severity of the situation. And we were just told two weeks Mm -hmm. to, to just completely stay inside as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and don't be around people and you can't go to work. Um, so that I think was immediately freeing of like, I can't go to work. I like cannot apply for jobs right now. Right. There's not, it's not allowed. Um, so I just knew that that was out of the question and I was like, what am I going to do in my room by myself? Like I can make music. I can do that. Yeah. Cause I can't do stand up and can't really make film stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, so there was that immediate direct limitation of what can I do creatively in my room by myself. Perfect coronavirus activity. Yes, yes. Music was very good. Lyric writing and recording and, you know, beat selection and all that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, once I got the money, like, then they backlogged it of like two months worth, something like that. Mm. Um, you know, I got, I got a big chunk of money and I ended up kind of just fucking around you know just, oh yeah yeah you know mm-hmm. um i went up to boone to see my friend zach like a couple of times just hung out with him okay um i might, I might have done a little bit of creative stuff i might have made like a music video mm-hmm. um but yeah i could barely get started on more music or and i was doing stand-up yeah i was doing quite a bit of stand-up yeah but well yeah so that would be my my concern with having all the money is I you know I can afford the most expensive chocolate bars and uh, I should be careful not to just sit around eating chocolate bars all the time. Do you really like chocolate bars? Oh man, expensive those, ones. Those who chocolate bars? Oh yeah, those, man, yeah. Those when are, I was eating dark chocolate, those were my favorites. Oh, you're off the dark chocolate. Yeah, it's caffeine, dude. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forget about that sometimes. <laughs> I also, like, with my meat diet, I don't believe cacao's good for us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is, uh, what, what does it do? Uh, well, it's just it's a plant-derived... Um, mm-hmm. Well, it is a plant, and it has defense chemicals in it. Mm. So um, I'm not specifically sure which defense chemicals are in cacao, mm. um, but... I don't know if they're the defense chemicals that are um, thyroid hormone inhibitors or whether they're inflammatory to the gut or both, but that's Mm. typically what the defense chemicals do to us. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. And I don't know like how severe they are, whether it's like a, you know, a mildly toxic one or if it's like, no, this is pretty serious Uh, one. Plant poisons. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. All the things to maybe not eat or eat. Right. Mm, so many options. <laughs> but yeah, getting back to that, that question, uh, I would, and, and talking about God, I, uh, I've got this satirical comedy that, uh, I've been working, working on for a while called God and Moses mm-hmm. BFF. Right. And I made a short film about it, but there's a larger story that could be told that involves, uh, <clears throat> God and Moses mm. and their uh, relationship bringing them to a place where they they discover that you know God is not really the real God mm. and heaven is not really the real heaven and uh, it's they they got to deal they got to deal with that mm. and find find God and find heaven in themselves essentially right as is how it goes uh well you've been working on this for a long time do you feel like your experience in hawaii helped you figure out some things that were necessary to maybe complete this satirical comedy i think so at least least, least get some more ideas about it uh i was wearing this shirt t-shirt a lot in Hawaii uh, that says y'all need Satan on it Mm. that a friend of mine gave me a good friend of mine and it would spark up a lot of conversations and some of them kind of nasty. Yeah. People would get pretty mad about that shirt. Uh, People love this shirt. Did you read it? I lubricate my AR 15 with liberal cum. That seems right. <laughs> but how are they going to masturbate all those liberals? Where are they getting this cum? 
Yeah, I don't know, man. I just like the shirt. <laughs> I just put it on to cover up my tits. There's a lot of questions involved in that. Yeah. Con- conservatives jerking off liberals. Right. Well, so here's... <laughs> I think the the shirt is really like it's supposed to be like a meme where I lubricate my AR-15 with liberal tears. I think is the original thing, but oh, someone was okay. just being funny and <laughs> like, <laughs> <it> with gum. <laughs> I like the visual of that better. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's funnier. That's nice. So cum and tears, that'd be the combo <laughs> right there. Right. Which I don't know. It's fun to think about. Mm-hmm. Crying and coming, liberals crying and coming. <laughs> you could also <laughs> extract cum from liberals um, rather than jerking them off yourself. You could use some of those like Chinese milking machines. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's that's smart. That'll save a lot of strength, <laughs> arm strength. Yeah. <laughs> and time. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> what? Uh... <laughs> we were talking about God, Moses, BFF. Oh yeah. Um what do you Not, mean uh what or what do you what do you think about Jesus and Moses discovering like making these realizations about God and heaven? Do you what do you think it is that they discover about the true nature of these things? Uh I think I think that it's achievable here on earth mm, within okay. ourselves. Yeah. And it's nothing that it's not found. about the afterlife. Right. It's about here and now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, my buddy that commented on my Satan shirt, uh, he was like, man, I think I think Satan's technology. Yeah, I think we talked about this a little bit over the phone. <laughs> yeah, which I think is a fun a fun dichotomy. If nature is this thing that's that's wild and free um and viewing technology is this this thing that wants to organize and mm-hmm. categorize and, and label and get everything on a grid and control it's pretty much the opposite of of what nature's doing of, mm. of its wild free creation destruction cycle and uh and this technology thing you know it's as we were talking about before it's it's hard to for a lot of people to get access to nature, to nature, God, but technology is, is so accessible. Yeah. We can sit at home during Corona time and make incredible rap albums with our, (laughs) with our technology. Yeah. There are good things we can do with technology. And I think this goes back to the, absolutely what I told you on the phone. I don't know if you remember, but Mm -hmm. it also goes back to the thing I was saying before about seeing God as a force or an abstract force. I see Satan as the same thing. Mm. The abstract force. God is the abstract force for that which is good. Satan is the abstract force for that which is not, <laughs> which is evil. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that to your friend's point, Satan has hot. Satan is not technology, but Satan has very much so hijacked technology and the industrialized Western society as we know it. Um, but there still is a little bit of God. Oh yeah. In the technology and the industrialization. Cause and we're a little bit of God. Right. And so that's how we're using it. Yeah. 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 Um, and I thought, yeah, cause I'm not, I'm not subscribing to that, that, you know, technology is definitely the devil. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, especially since potentially in the next, however many years technology could become a God, a legit God when it becomes aware and when and if Hmm. if this singularity occurs and artificial intelligence is able to replicate itself and then we got you know technology making technology on its own yeah and uh so in that case you know we got man humans making our own god yeah potentially yeah depending on our relationship with this thing is it either going to, you know, enslave us or set us free or, you know, anything in between, mm. which is really fun to think about. And <laughs> yeah. Do you, you have know. fears about where AI is going? Uh, it's just part of the, the what weird fun ride that we're, we're yeah. on or potentially fucking scary ride <laughs> right. that, that we're on right now. 
Yeah. I guess it's not so scary right now. So no. maybe no need to get scared until we got something to really be scared of. <laughs> maybe. Right. I don't know. Maybe a little neurotic fear might help prevent something really horrible from happening, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right now, I mean, just two nights ago, me and my buddy asked chat gpt mm. to to write a rap song about human manure and it came up with a pretty good song with what what manure human human manure human manure yeah this is another thing i thought I was, you said human manure i thought you were talking about those chocolate bars again it, <laughs> <laughs> that would be, like that'd damn be, those things shit that'd be twisted <laughs> marketing for them uh, human. I was I was doing a lot with human manure in Hawaii. Oh, you were just grouping the word together, human manure. Yeah, that's yeah. what that's what people say to to save time. They save so many seconds off their life by right. by combining those words. I guess if they use those that compound word a lot, if they're talking about it a lot. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, they can earn you know a few minutes of their life back per year. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, that's one of the things I was also doing in Hawaii. Uh, a lot of planting with poop. Yeah, you know, poop from the past. Yeah. We would poop in, uh, you know, we had structures that giant 50-gallon mm. trash trash cans would be underneath, and we'd poop in there and, and cover it with salt. And you use it to harvest. Sawdust and biochar. Mike and, was just on here telling me about using fecal matter uh, yeah. to harvest natural energy. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that seems right. Yep. He'll <laughs> be so excited to hear. <laughs> By the way, I know he's going to be listening to this, <laughs> Mike. We know you're watching, Mike. Yeah, I know you're watching this right I mean, now. This won't come out to the first week of April, but Mike, just so you know, I'm about to surprise you. This is we're recording this podcast right before I'm about to bring Johnny over to your house to surprise you. You're going to get surprised. Mike doesn't even know he's back. That's right. Yep. Get ready. This will be a little nugget. Mike will watch this weeks into the future and go. Oh, oh, wow. Well, that happened. <laughs> yep. Yeah, get ready for the past, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. That's for one specific viewer of this podcast, and now we're just confusing all the others. Yep. You're all the, welcome, everybody. All the hundreds of millions. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they'll get excited about this human or topic that we're talking oh, yeah. about now. I think that's why most people are watching the podcast. Is that they, right. Yeah. Well, it is, it is hilarious, I think. Because it's, you know, part of the life cycle. Uh, we could be growing paradise yeah. with this stuff, you know, if we're using it right. But we've humans have chosen, for the most part, to put it in tubes of water, <laughs> to ship it in tubes of water uh, blocks miles, miles away. Yeah. To who knows? I don't even know where it goes here. Yeah. I think we just put it underground in big cement chambers. <laughs> we use metal pipes to just shoot it down into a big cement chamber underground. Yeah, so it can have no harm. It can't harm us anymore. This, yeah. The stuff that is potentially very helpful to us. I know. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Maybe, maybe harvesting human shit is is going to become a very big thing over the next I, w I wouldn't be surprised century. if uh, yeah a lot of people reframe their their view around this thing I wouldn't either after having two guests now that are trying that are selling it to me I'm, I'm almost convinced now all it's going to take is one more <laughs> guest and I'm going to start harvesting my own shit <laughs> it's so tricky you know I, I was staying with my parents and I was asking them, you know, is there some way I can poop in the yard and, and get this, uh, <laughs> utilize all this poop that I'm, I'm wasting here. And they just weren't, they weren't into it. You know, they wouldn't let you poop in the yard. They wouldn't let me poop in the yard. And maybe it's because I phrase it like that. I'm pooping in the yard and maybe not if I, maybe if you ask me, I fertilize the yard. There we go. That'd be nice. And you just don't tell them exactly what you mean by that. <laughs> the fertilizer's coming out of me. Don't ask me any more questions about it. <laughs> oh, man. But it is it is interesting that, you know, I see this as one of the ways that we've been separated from real God, from nature God. That we're not playing with our own shit. <laughs> we're, not, we're not utilizing 
this this resource that's yeah. coming out of our bodies. Uh, and it's it's very similar with you know water in general. Just we got we got water also traveling to us through through tubes. Yeah, we're we're rarely interacting with it in a, a natural mm. natural setting. Um, yeah, I mean, and the f- the separation with our with our food as well. A lot of us aren't really growing our mm. own food, and we're just like getting it from from a store. Yeah. You know? Did you have a lot of uh, naturally delicious, naturally sourced water while you were in Hawaii? Uh, there was a few springs that were that were really tasty yeah and uh yeah get in there and splash around drink it uh get in it naked yeah uh Did ask, you? ask it questions you ask a lot of <laughs> questions yeah <laughs> and it seems like it seems like it gives an answer yeah that's funny you know you remember um making that part of your monologue and zygote as the therapist oh. What did I say? The scene you did for Zygo where you're the therapist. This is a short film that Cameron made. Just yeah. Yeah. If you want to look up. it up, <clears throat> it's on YouTube in full. It's like an hour long, but Johnny satirical get, abortion comedy. One <laughs> yes. of the few. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Johnny absolutely crushed it in his role <laughs> as the therapist where it's um, that, you know, that movie is mostly very to the T to the script. But there, that one scene, the first half, it's like an eight minute scene. The first half of it <clears throat> is what I wrote in the script. And then the whole back half of it is me letting Johnny just go off the rails in terms of this whole him justifying um, why it's okay to abort fetuses because they don't have consciousness. Mm. And then he goes on this whole rant about like not all human beings even into their old age get this kind of self-awareness sort of consciousness and he starts complaining about this one particular (laughs) client he has called mr dan um but in there you're talking you're talking about the consciousness thing and you bring in the whole thing about water water has consciousness Mm. because they do these studies where people are whispering nice things to water yeah. whispering certain things or, or yelling at it and mm-hmm. watching its molecular shape change in response to the, the emotional energy. Well, I've forgotten how much I crammed into this improv oh, yeah. session. Dude, it is, it's a magnificent scene. Cool. Yeah. Gotta go back and check that out again. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that made me think of it. I, <laughs> the water thing. So uh, to to get back to this Let's talk about gods. Yes. If uh, if I may. And talking about this disconnection from, from nature god, it seems like a big part of this is the what I what I view as the false gods mm. that have come to dominate human existence. Yeah. And just like with the real gods, there's a holy trinity of sorts mm. of these as well. And that would be the big one, government, and number two, corporations, and number three, organized religion. Hmm. And, you know, especially government, it seems like it's, uh, you know, similar to God in, in ways. It's this entity that clouts itself as something that can sol- solve society's problems it lets us uh pray to it in a way interact with it in the form of voting pledging allegiance pledging allegiance um it wants a much like a a church it wants a tithe in the form of a tax and it's even spread this tax to people that supposedly own their own piece of nature god Hmm. and these people still have to pay every year this tithe this tax this rent Mm -hmm. they don't really own it they don't really even own this thing that they say they own because they're still paying this 
fake god government entity that has laid claim over all of real god mm. um and the only entities that can own real god and not have to pay this tax rent tithe are corporations and organized religions that and they aren't people they're also this entity much like government that has this godlike status of it will keep living forever as long as people believe in it mm. aka keep giving it money or attention and Yeah, these, these entities, I see them as distractions in so many ways from, from the real God, yeah. from, from nature and our connection to it and our connection to our, ourselves yeah. as well. <clears throat> so I don't, um, <clears throat> I don't inherently disagree with you. Um, okay, good. Yeah. That's I, good news. There's a few things that come up almost from a, because I'm kind of in between, you know, like I, on one hand, I believe w what you just laid out and I think it feels good, feels right. Mm. But there's also, and I also will agree that where we are with all that stuff that you're saying is a distraction from real God, this false God of government and I guess, you know, corporate Western society. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like with all of that, yeah, the industrialization of the Western world, government and organized religion and all these things, I feel like there is something useful and good about those things that need, that, that may be worth preserving. Like it's a don't throw the baby out with the bathwater situation. Cause there's a lot of bathwater. Oh yeah. And, um, there's a lot of misuse of these things that may be good in some way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not saying, you know, we, we should yeah. destroy all these things or, or whatever. I'm just supplying awareness for how I see these entities yeah. and maybe, uh, it it helps somebody to see it in mm. this fashion as well. Yeah. Because it's it certainly has freed freed me up in ways just to to look at these entities. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. And and myself and nature and in this way is uh is pretty empowering. Yes. Yeah, well <laughs> so um like one one piece like one thought that I have that I think helps clarify a little bit of like why I, I would even humor playing a devil's advocate role um, is, you know, especially a lot of these like environmentalist arguments we have, there's like this inherent presupposition that humans and what humans do is separate from nature. Mm. And I don't know if we are right in that assessment or that judgment you know, like where is that line where we as human beings are no longer part of nature? Cause I think if you were to take some hypothetical alien to come down and analyze the planet and all the different species and, and also like thinking about the aliens intelligence compared to ours would be like our intelligence compared with an ants, you know, like we distinguish no, not to get too far in that, but um, <clears throat> the way that like the alien would observe something like a bird and see that the bird builds nests. Yeah. Like that the nest is part of nature and it's a thing that the bird, which is also part of nature built. I feel like aliens would see human beings as an animal in nature, part of nature and that things like buildings and homes 
these this is the human version of a nest yeah this is what they do they take the natural resources of the world like the birds take sticks natural resources of the world and construct a thing for it to live in and interact with it's just humans are doing a much more complicated version of a nest all right so i agree with yeah i agree we are nature yeah yeah so i think um you know there is this evolutionary playing out of our nest building right where we may be going too far like Mm -hmm. learning things like oh you know what maybe shoes aren't so good for us because they disrupt our natural connection to the electromagnetic field that is on you know the surface of earth the organic organism that is earth yeah and we have a lot of inflammation issues because of our constant disconnectedness to that right so that's a misstep maybe we should do something to correct that maybe get rid of shoes or start wearing shoes that can connect with (laughs) that could protect our feet one because that is a good thing about shoes they protect our feet from glass and fire ants and um all sorts of dangers that are on the ground this is the perfect metaphor yeah what we're talking about yeah yes exactly so i was like well maybe we could make shoes out of a material that can still connect with the ground and give us what the earth like is supposed to be giving us. Right. But still protect our feet and preserve that, you know, balance the nature with the human innovation. Um, and yeah, all sorts of things like that. Like, like I know we have all sorts of views on, uh, the medical field and Western medicine, like surgeries and medications. I, I I'm someone that believes these are, great technological innovations and they have their use but perhaps we're overusing them you know perhaps we really should only be using them in like emergency situations where it's like they could prevent death but if it's like oh this this is some like chronic illness that you could solve by adjusting your diet or putting your feet on the ground more often right um changing your water supply all sorts of things like that yeah. like, no you probably don't need to be taking these pills that are going to be giving you <laughs> all sorts of perhaps worse side effects yeah but um i would like to hear you talk now <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love that pass yeah so yeah this, we are uh yeah there for one reason or another we humans in general have set these things up mm have have given these entities our attention our our power our uh our money <laughs> and i feel like it's for you know whatever the reasons are that i think i think a lot of it has to do with our our fear of of death mm. of leaving this place and going into this unknown territory that we've got to, we've got to hang on to something somehow. We've got to create this these things that can last forever. Yeah. This government, these these products, or these uh, this organized belief mm. into this this thing that is unbelievable. Like you can't know one way or the other what the hell is going to happen after this after this life. Right. Until you get there. Um. And yeah, not that that's good or bad. It just adds to the the complexity of whatever the hell is going on here. Right. This weird ass maybe game that we're in, mm-hmm. which I, I think is a fun way to look at this this thing that we're in. Yeah, game. Yeah. What if this is just a an odd game that we're playing? Um, and. <clears throat> And I get that when you wake up, you, when you die, you wake up in an arcade chair. And that's it. <laughs> yep. Put in another quarter. <laughs> yeah. Go again. Um. But I've, I've, to connect this back to what we were talking about with with nature and mm. and technology. Um. I feel like there is an important connection there. And, uh, you know, especially with what is potentially coming in the future with technology becoming maybe a God. 
and I feel this way because of a DM tri- DMT trip that I uh, went on where I, I consumed DMT mm-hmm. and the whole world, including myself, fractaled into very mechanical looking, but also very natural looking vines, limbs, and circuits mm. that moved around until it formed a face of what I deemed to be the creator of everything mm-hmm. talking to me. And so this creator is made of of technology and nature. Mm-hmm. Which leads to me to believe that these are maybe maybe our two, uh, if not if not if not gods, then just just great teachers yeah. that's guiding us on this incredible journey of this yeah. life. Because there's so much to learn from both of those, and I feel like they they help each other so much hmm. for for example like if you were looking up how to make a salad <laughs> like hmm. that's made of nature but you can easily look up on the internet and see hundreds maybe thousands of, of various recipes and and then you could you could take that even further and learn how these things are grown or you know how the the microbes in the soil are affecting how these are grown, how they're affecting the microbes in your body, mm. and the best ways to manipulate on the macro on the micro level what's happening on the the macro, which is uh, an, a really special part of the universe. Also, right. these these tiny tiny things that are essentially affecting us, affecting our whole being. Yeah. Um, okay, you talk. You talk now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I. I mean, I feel like I'm at the point in the God conversation where you know I'm just. It's an infinite conversation to be had. Just uh, talking oh, about the no. nature of existence and reality, and how complex this damn place is. Right. You know, there's infinite complexity. I see the whole damn thing folds into to itself, like further down you go microscopically you end up back at the big picture and the the further out you go you end up back at the microscopic level um there was something in there that um was some sort of sci-fi idea that made me think of but oh yeah sci-fi i've idea. lost it do mm. you do you want to talk about some other stuff like um i've got a sci-fi idea that we could talk about what is it What about this for a sci-fi film? Uh, Two scientists figure out how to change bodies. And uh, they're also attracted to each other. And they they fuck each other. Mm. And so they're essentially fucking themselves. And that's the the climax of the film is them fucking themselves and and looking at each other in the eyes and... Climaxing. (laughs) The climax of the film is when they climax. That's when they climax. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that would do really Sci- well at the box office. <laughs> Sci-fi porn. Yeah. Um, there's also you. Yeah, you asked me about stuff learned in in Hawaii. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think the the mo- the most special stuff I, I got into uh, to me was a lot of dancing, a lot of improv contact dancing, which is just people making up a dance on the spot to whatever the music is inspiring them to do together. Mm-hmm. That's so much fun. Um, and also singing, connecting tones with each other. It feels like it opens up uh, my brain to a portal or something, mm-hmm. another dimension. It feels very powerful. And, do you um, want to try to match tones? I would love to. Are we going to do the ohm? We can do ohm. We can... Uh, Give me some some we can, options. We can start with ohm. There's the vowel sounds. Any of the vowel sounds we can do, which connects with various chakras of our bodies. Um, but maybe ohm is a, is a okay. good place to start. 
do you want to do we just go at the same time and then try to match it uh let's take a let's take a deep breath in and then oh fucking weird yeah <laughs> yeah that was it's especially weird with these headphones on you yeah really, yeah, yeah or even even better with these headphones on you yeah really you can really feel it yeah mm-hmm. you can really get down to adjust mm-hmm. you know with that feedback uh my favorite is the e sound okay we can do e yeah i've never heard e before so e, e- listeners uh. <laughs> <laughs> that one makes you make a fun face too yeah you, you, gotta, you gotta smile when you do it uh-huh <laughs> i like that thanks for doing that with me oh yeah oh man if we do the the whole list of vowels we'll be mm-hmm. in a whole new mindset so something that i feel like might be a fun thing to get into while you were away you mostly weren't on the internet i wasn't but you did get on the internet sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. You, you popped up to make some Facebook posts that... Uh, Are you about to bring up some Facebook posts? Well, I mean, I didn't like have any specific ones. This is just like... Oh. Um, I thought you were going to fi- recall some. No, no, I wasn't gonna, like going to pull up. Like, you just made this comment <laughs> in 2020 about that. No, no, no. I was just... Uh, that excited me for a second. The possibility of that. Oh, uh, well, I mean, I could just go on your Facebook and well, start pulling them up. But. That's true. If we, yeah, what is the, uh, I'm curious. Should I do that? Should I just pull up your Facebook on the screen and then. I think that'd be fun. Um, and we can, we can comment on it. It was, it, it's a very interesting time that time. Cause well, for me personally, because of where I was and who I was hanging out with, I was doing pretty opposite stuff from what tv and mainstream in general was saying to do i was touching people more than i'd ever touched people in my life because of this improv contact thing that i was getting into i had stopped using very much soap if at all Mm. because i was living in the jungle a lot and uh it getting away from using anything that had any chemically sounding words involved in it as far as putting it on my skin or inside of my body and uh, basically refusing you know because I I breathe a lot and I know that it's a big part of the reason why I'm alive so I was pretty against wearing a mask for the most part anywhere which would lead to a, some people being upset with me but it didn't seem like a an unreasonable request to be able to breathe properly which is <clears throat> the basis of a few of the Facebook posts that I that I posted Look at your hair in this picture. That's a good. Yeah. It's a good quaff. Good swoop. Right, there we go. Just want to get it screen recording. So oh, I can nice. use this later. Smart. All right. Johnny Gray. Let's see. Yeah, I haven't had a whole lot of Facebook posts over the years, so we shouldn't have to scroll down too far. All right. That's the good thing about not posting very much. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, we got other people posting way more than I'm oh, posting. Oh, yeah, what the hell? Oh, my goodness. 
interesting post about AI. I don't remember posting that. I don't remember posting a lot of the stuff. I don't know. Maybe we should have just kept it abstract. Uh huh. Did you go back and uh, delete these posts? No way. <laughs> They're staying forever. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, that's when I found twenty dollars on the ground. It's twenty twenty two. Guess you're posting more than I thought. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get to like twenty 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 one so much faster. Oh yeah. September second. Wow. Yeah, so many people are, are posting. Posting on my page. Jesus Christ. I did think it was interesting talking about talking about mask wearing uh in in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> this one my pronouns are all of them <laughs> that's right i'm pronouns nice uh, amazing joke my buddy can't look shared there it is. shared zygote and a friend of mine watched it and really liked it oh yeah and she sent a very sweet message that i shared with you that's right shout out to i can't remember her name do you remember her name i don't remember right now <laughs> I have to go. Some friend. Some friend. Uh, well, dude, I might just have to say that this is a bust. Well, I understand if you want to. All right. Well, let's just keep ba- keep it abstract. Down. Okay. <laughs> that was a nice effort, though. It was. That would have been that. Uh, that would be fun, though. To, uh, and that that might be something fun you can do in the future. Just pull up somebody's Facebook yeah. post from years ago and be like, "Hey, tell us about this." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell us about this. I'll moment. become more of a confrontational journalist soon enough. That'd be um. Great. Anyway, yeah. I just you. I mean, you started kind of talking about it, like, um, and I I think you and I mostly agree on the, a lot of the the COVID stuff. It's probably not even going to be that fun of a conversation, (laughs) but it is, it was just funny that you would just post some pretty like middle of the road. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't think masks work or like, Mm. I don't think it's a good idea to get vaccinated or something like that. And and people just like are coming at you. I can't remember the really clever ways I put these things, but yeah, I think it was, it was usually stuff like I enjoy breathing. Mm air yeah and uh it, yeah it even, a even of smart at the smartness to it yeah <laughs> yeah but even as as simple as I, as i can make it like a comment like that it, it would often be uh infuriating to some <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah which it adds i mean i guess is that that's what that's what people are on facebook for i guess sometimes to, yeah to, for the rage to get enraged about something and yeah. have an outlet for the for the opinions. Yeah. Well, you and I are definitely both vaccinated. Have you gotten your booster shot? I've gotten so many boosters. Yeah, I can't maybe get too, maybe too many. I can't get enough of them. <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, if you do one a day, then yeah, that's enough. Oh yeah, I mean at I, least I, I quit caffeine and I started taking a booster <laughs> shot every morning. <laughs> That'll get you going. Yeah. Man, I. I I think it's really interesting that I would imagine so many people know people that have been vaccinated and still have gotten COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, people are still going for this vax thing. Yeah. I mean, it was, (sighs) even though it doesn't protect from the thing that it supposedly protects from. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was just, well, like I think so. Here's my thing about the vaccine that like really bothered the shit out of me because there was just so many uh, people I considered to be very level-headed and intelligent people that were just taking the CNN report of like, yeah, we pumped these vaccines out very quickly, but the science is settled; <laughs> they're a hundred percent safe and effective. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. Right. They're yeah, they're or maybe not hundred. They're ninety-nine point nine percent safe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. 
<laughs> and and you know that because you did science. Okay, got it. Understood. Yeah, yeah I believe them. Where it's, you know, this and this is the element that really bothered me because again, people I consider to be smart, mm. but like, you, you don't just do science and then reach a conclusion that's just solid forever. Yeah. Right. Like you can do science to get the thing made, but in terms of being able to deter, to in terms of being able to determine whether the thing is safe is you have to give it yeah. to people, to people, yeah. human beings mm. and see what happens to them over the course of several years. You have to see the long-term effects yeah. it has on people. The only thing, even if they were doing human trials on, even if it was a lot of people, they're only going to be able to measure the immediate short-term effects. Yeah. Before rolling the damn thing out and saying, all right, it's available. Yeah. And so, Uh, (laughs) you know, they have zero data on long-term effects. They cannot confidently make any claim that this is 99 point whatever Mm. safe and effective and you will not have any long-term consequences from the, and they're fucking around with new vaccine technology, like this whole MRNA thing. (laughs) And and yeah. for anyone to even claim, yeah, I know what that means. It makes sense after reading this article mm. <laughs> th- that I'm sure explained it to me in a way that is not misleading or deceptive. <laughs> you know, right. um, yeah, I don't know. It just um, well, and then meanwhile, you got stuff that has been proven safe and effective for decades that is being denied. Oh yeah, like the ivermectin shit. You know, like I've well that type of stuff, and simply human contact oh, and yeah. being around each other, breathing properly, natural immunity, natural immunity, yeah. huge one, yeah. Oh yeah, people acting like that's a, a conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. Natural immunity is a conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, funny. It is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and those same programs that will will say stuff like that are are selling Hardee's double stack, <laughs> triple triple bacon, yeah, bacon cup or whatever it is, and uh, you know, whatever other drugs they're pushing, right? It's the biggest drug dealers in the world. Yeah, and also the logic there too of like choosing to trust the big corporate entity that has all the money to gain. And not and not saying like what what does the crazy mentally ill conspiracy theorist online have to gain from telling you mm. that that vaccines don't work yeah. or that they're not good? Right. What do they have to gain? Mm. They're not getting any money from you not getting vaccinated. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know there there's not like a subscribe. I mean, not not across the board. I'm sure there are in some cases, but like, hey, if you want to hear more of my anti-vax policies, subscribe to my Patreon. You know, right? Take my my ten course. <laughs> Don't put a vaccine in your veins. Yeah. Ad. Get on my anti-vax OnlyFans. Yeah, <laughs> it's possible we'll have to cut all this out. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. CDC cracking down on you yeah maybe not though maybe it's maybe everybody's forgotten about it now yeah maybe and we can talk freely about it well that's another thing too that was super fucked up was was how we couldn't even have this discussion and i don't know i still don't know if we really can have it without this video getting flagged Mm -hmm. or eventually taken down or reported right um and people having much more tame conversations where they're just genuinely asking questions. Yeah. You know. All right. It's really disturbing. That's yeah, that is the most frustrating part for me as well, getting the, the censorship of it. To not be able to fully flesh out these ideas and, and openly figure these things out together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no there's no humility of ignorance on I mean on both sides but I think particularly the side of like trust the government trust the science believe the science yeah you know there's no humility of like hey we might be wrong 
Yeah. Right. You know, like, yeah, we, it's true. We don't know the long term effects, but we feel pretty good about it. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we think it's worth, it's worth the risk of what might happen to you with the vaccine more so than it is what might happen to you if you don't get it. Mm-hmm. And then months later or a year later realizing, Oh no, sorry. We were wrong about that guess. Yeah. <laughs> sorry uh, about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's presented like we're the experts. We know it. Yeah. No need to question anything. Even, even stuff that you naturally innately know, like that you should be able to breathe good. That breathing good is part of good health. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that can yeah, somehow get disregarded. They can be like, well, experts say you better put a mask on that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but that's where the danger comes in is when it seems like when other people are, are saying you got to do it this way. Mm. It's not about what you're feeling is, is the best thing for you. It's, uh, you got to do it this way. Otherwise you're hurting me somehow. Yeah. And there's, uh, yeah, it gets just like, mm fluffed up with all this fear from, yeah. from the experts or from whatever, whatever this information is coming from. Yeah. And I, I feel like too, just in the whole course of like my personal development, I feel like I got to, I'm very lucky that I got to the place I was psychologically to even be prepared for something like the pandemic. Hmm. To to ha to have a healthy sense of distrust because I think if this would have happened maybe like four years before, I probably I, I might have been a little more on the dogmatic trust the science side. I don't know that for sure, mm. but um, I think I think this whole like twenty seventeen awakening that I constantly am talking about. Oh, um, this is a personal awakening awakening for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay that you know the the fundamental element of it was being someone who would profess to be more atheistic and nihilistic mm. the, the thing that got me out of that was just waking up to how ignorant and limited i am in my understanding of reality and how believing that there is no god believing that it's all nothing believing that you know the whole point is to just chase simple hedonistic pleasures and mm. that kind of thing realizing how dumb and flawed human beings are and that I am also one of them. Yeah. Like I am a dumb, flawed human being. Right. And that, and to believe that there is no God is just as much of a belief as believing there is one. Yeah. You know, there's no escape from just believing things. I mean, it's, it's, you have to have faith in science to, to believe in it because there's plenty of people that don't have faith in science and don't believe a fucking word of it. Yeah. But that's right. And I'm not one of those people. But I don't, I no longer hold this faith that science answers everything and that it is God. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not, it's not the, the only lens I view the world through. It's one of many. Mm. And um, even in my capacity to view the world through lenses, you know, I don't see things perfectly. Mm. I might not even see them all that good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I might be like really dumb. Mm. Um, so I think in that, it's kind of like my climate change denier joke, you know? Yeah. It's like we have this idea, like we understand that most people are dumb mm-hmm. and we have this idea that scientists are the geniuses of society. It's like, no, they're, they're also dumb people <laughs> like us. <laughs> there's, you know, there's a few really brilliant minds moving yeah. the scientific field along, but they're few and far between. Also, isn't isn't science the the observation, the the question you're observing and questioning, and the observations and, and questions just keep on going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you know you run experiments and you ask a question. Sorry, you ask a question. You run experiments. You get an answer for now. Yeah, and then other people, you know try to repeat the experiments and see if that answer holds up. And the more repeated experiments you have where the answer holds up, you know, the more you can believe that that's a solid answer. Um, 
But even then, maybe there's something wrong with the several experiments yeah. and the processes that were being run. Maybe you're asking the wrong question. Maybe the answer is more nuanced than the experiments can even reveal. Yeah. And <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we're as limited as we are. So are is our ability to ask the questions and to understand and comprehend the answer and to make observations and record data and run experiments, you know, like all of our actions are just as limited as we are. Right. Yeah. Cause we're just, we're just people. We are just flawed individuals trying our best to figure out this whole thing. Well, since we're not scientists, should we switch over to uh, creativity? Creativity. Yeah. How can we best create? Art. I uh, I brought this stuff that I've enjoyed also from Hawaii for you to try if you want. It's um, it's called noni. Okay. From, from a fruit called noni. Uh, and this is a very strange looking fruit. It looks like it has very many eyeballs mm-hmm. on it. And it's also good for eyeballs. I, p- I put the stuff in my eyeballs. Okay. And I put it on my face and eat it and uh, put it in my ear holes and my nose holes. Basically all my holes. I've only tried it on my butthole once, but it didn't It didn't seem like did it did. Did you put that exact syringe in your butthole? No, I didn't stick it. I didn't stick it in there. It was more of a drop it from afar kind of thing or, you know few inches above um but i think this i think this stuff is really amazing and some people put it in their eyeballs every day Mm. to help their eyesight and uh it definitely stings quite a bit when you put it in there but then it it feels really good and it feels really clear clearing Mm. um so yeah, I, th- I think it. I think it's helpful for for creativity as far as a, a reset, much like a, a meditation. Mm. And uh, does it have like psychedelic properties? N- no. So when you eat it, it's just nothing happens. It's uh, supposedly very beneficial for for health mm. in ways that I don't have the detailed words for because I ain't no dang scientist. Um, but yeah, this is, this is something that, uh, maybe we can try. Maybe we can, I I mean, I'll put it on myself right now as a a demonstration, you know, just to get some physical going on on this, this podcast where we're, we're just sitting talking. Sorry, audio only listeners. I'm just putting it on my third eye right now. Ooh. It feels really good. Oh my god! I guess I can put some on my forehead. You know, it's not the worst thing. And this is gonna make me more creative. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, you're doing good. You're getting two drops. That's what you did. Yeah. Does that feel nice? I guess so. Uh, I don't know if I can <laughs> tell the difference between this and water on my forehead. Well, let's put it in our eyeballs and spend a few minutes just... Uh, I don't know if... I, I'm bad about putting eye drops in. <laughs> and you said it stings? It does sting. Yeah, you definitely Dude. you definitely got to hang out with your eyes closed just for a little bit. Yeah, I'm not going to put it in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an interesting it's, smell. Yeah. It's a very, uh, I've, I've bitten into this fruit just raw mm. and, oh, bazing. Yeah. It'll get you going. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Literally. Man, you can tar- taste it if you want. What's it taste like? It doesn't taste like anything I've ever tasted before. Mm. I swear to God, if this is a psychedelic, I'll fucking murder you. <laughs> That's just part of God. Psychedelics. Like, I'm really not going to trip? I don't think so, no. 
What do you if mean you, you don't you think start, so? If you start tripping, then it's, I don't think it's the stuff. Okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be responsible just for gave me liquid DMT for whatever else you've done. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, creativity, you and I have had a number of collaborations. Oh yeah. Let's talk about collaborations. And, um, well, you had something in your notes too. You wanted to talk about, uh, your comic philosophy. Oh, did I mention that in my notes? Comedic philosophy might be the word you said, but oh, well, I I, I would like to create with you while I'm back around. Mm. Would uh, you know? I guess we're doing that right now. Yeah, we are. But you know, I'm also open to other other ways. Yeah, that we can we can do such things. Well, I know you like music videos. I like music videos, and I like. I like making silly songs. I listened to a little bit of that podcast link you sent me. I didn't get to listen to a lot of it. What did I say? Uh, oh, the one that I was on previous. Yeah. And okay. like at the very beginning of it, you started talking about, like he asked you why, why you like music videos so much. So, mm-hmm. I, cause that was going to be a question to you. So I know a little bit about your answer about them. Um, you like that they can be passively experienced. They mm-hmm. can just be on in a room, but you can still socialize. Mm-hmm. While some visuals are going on and you're just listening to the music. Yes. You also like that they're short mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. serialized television is maybe a little too long to get the full picture of the story. Uh-huh. You, you can get the whole thing in about three minutes with a music video. Mm-hmm. But that's about all I... That's all you got all that, huh? Over ten, yeah, because I, I wasn't able to listen to a whole lot. I, I kind of did it in the middle of working on stuff earlier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I also like that it's you know one way or the other affecting affecting our lives in maybe all kinds of <clears throat> subconscious ways. Hmm. I think about the uh, one of my first music video experiences, Michael Jackson's Thriller, hmm. and just experiencing that as a, as a young child, and going back and watching it now as an adult. As you know, especially with the the context of Michael Jackson's story behind it, mm-hmm. it's such an incredible experience that it's evolved into. Mm. And uh, you know, because we we know the story of Michael Jackson and that he may have done some child molesting. Yeah, in his uh-huh. I've in, heard in his day, some of us have heard of this. And <laughs> breaking news <laughs> <laughs> in Thriller, Michael Jackson transforms not once but twice into a monster mm. and then convinces the the person that he's with that he's not a monster. And so it happens. At the beginning, when he he turns into a were cat, and then we find out, oh no, Michael Jackson! This is uh, an on screen version of Michael Jackson. He's watching a movie. Michael Jackson is really in the movie, or he's really watching this movie with his girlfriend. Mm. And then later, they leave the movie. Michael Jackson transforms into zombie monster. Michael Jackson. And scares the bejesus out of his girlfriend. And then all of a sudden transforms back into Michael Jackson. And it's like, what? What what are you so afraid of? He's like gaslighting this woman that he's with. And asked to walk her home. And they're about to walk home. And the last shot of the video is him knowingly turning to the camera, to us, the audience, with his werecat eyes. Letting us know, yeah, he's a monster. Yeah. Filling us in on it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's just such an incredible. I don't know if I've ever heard that interpretation, but. I don't think anybody's talking about this. Yeah. This is an exclusive (laughs) on this podcast. (laughs) But that's an incredible reveal, I believe, to the soul of this artist. Yeah that maybe he wasn't even fully aware of that's that's an interesting take or that's an interesting point of that take there because 
um, I've found my experience, I mean, with a lot of things, but particularly that five hour movie that you show your butthole in. <laughs> oh yeah. Check my butthole out. <laughs> Have you ever watched that scene? I watched the scene. You yeah. finally watched it? Yeah. I haven't, th- I haven't seen the whole movie. What'd you think about that scene? I, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I don't know if it had much to do with my butthole being in it, but yeah, I, it had to be in a fact, a factor yeah. in, in the level of enjoyment. It's a good uncomfortable scene. Yeah. Yeah. Doing Carlos well, knocking out of the park. And I, <laughs> it's funny. I'm acting with Carlos in that. And you brought up my Facebook post from earlier. Oh, yeah. Because at that time, I was making, uh, when I watched it, I was making posts like that. And Carlos was very angrily oh, com- yeah. commenting on my, my posts. Yeah, and, I saw. And this is the guy that acted like he enjoyed looking at my butthole. <laughs> and <laughs> in your film. <laughs> well that was acting he's a good actor yeah <laughs> i don't think he enjoyed it for real <laughs> right yeah probably not i don't even enjoy it for real look in that butthole it's like the darkest scariest hairiest place on my body like the dark part of my soul i like looking at um i don't mind a butthole that's good. You know, looking at your own butthole or, I mean, I, it's hard to look at my own. I don't, yeah. I mean, you I don't look at it right now if you wanted to, <laughs> I don't make an effort <laughs> to look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, like if there was just like a butthole out and spread open, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be like something I don't want to look at. It would be, Oh, right. put that away. What the hell? Oh yeah. I'd be like, huh? And I, you know, yeah, I'd check it out absolutely and also like depending on who it was like you know it's like a fat old hairy man's asshole i'd look at like like the like a curious kind of thing like Mm -hmm. okay huh but then if it's like an attractive woman pulling her asshole apart in front of you Mm -hmm. well then that's a different experience Right. That's when you go, ew, no. (laughs) (laughs) But that's where, you know. Gross. That's like, okay, I'm a little more interested. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing was intriguing. This is just extra intriguing. Oh, yeah. 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 I agree. I agree. I'm not going to look away from the It's intriguing and beautiful. I think the the old fat man's asshole, who's also hairy, Mm -hmm. is just intriguing but the beautiful woman is her pulling her asshole apart is intriguing and beautiful mm-hmm. and maybe more beautiful than intriguing depending on how beautiful the woman is. Right. Yeah. But well, that makes me curious about you looking at your own butthole and how was that, was that pull up from you for you when you, when you check out your own. Well, so a little, uh, a lesser known fact, and this is really my only experience of looking at my own butthole, mm. uh, is when you know, several years ago, back when I had a, a girlfriend, mm-hmm. um, I can't remember what the context was. Cause let me, I'll be straight up. If, uh, if this was, if this was not true or sorry, if this was a true thing about me, I would have no problem admitting it, but I don't have anything for butt stuff on me. Okay. Like if you're a girl, I'll do stuff with your butthole. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in that. Right. It's not like I need it or like I have a thing for it, but mm. I'm intrigued by it. Okay. Would be down. Yeah. But if you're not into it, fine. I'll, I'll let it go. I don't want anything with my butthole. I don't want a finger in there. I don't want you to eat my ass out. I'm not interested in it. Okay. No little fingers. Yeah. Okay. Um, so no, no insertion. Nothing has been inserted in your butthole yeah. ever. Yeah. I mean, I've probably tr- tr- stuck my own finger in there like okay. a little bit to try to fish out some like, you know, mm. poop crust or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Right, good. <laughs> this is so insane. Um, you got to. Anyway, <clears throat> but you haven't done that. No, I have not. Are but you I, not I, curious I, about the the male G spot in there? I'm not. Okay. The regular orgasm I get from ejaculating out of my penis is plenty for me, and honestly, I'm not even all that fascinated with it at that this point in my life. Anyway, mm. I find it to be kind of a cheap pleasure. Right. Um, well, because you haven't got a good butthole orgasm (laughs) (laughs) maybe have you had a good butthole orgasm before i've only had a couple of fingers in there you know separate separate occasions okay and yeah one of those orgasms was 
Well, they're both they're both very powerful, mm. but in different ways. And one was powerful in a very pleasurable way, and one was powerful, and I cried because it was like, oh wow, <laughs> it was like, like yeah. tears of joy, like tears of what the fuck is going on with my with my body? Oh uh, wow, scared you emotions, were frightened. Well, like you know, because I'm not a very emotional person. Mm. So it was like, is that where my emotions are? In the G spot or butthole? <laughs> They've been hanging out in here this this whole time. Yeah. And uh Well so, so so yeah, there's some powerful stuff going on. Right. Well, I, and also I think this goes back to why I'm also just not interested in the orgasm that experience myself is because like i've just lost interest in like these really high neurochemical releases like Mm. the the orgasmic feeling you get from psychedelics Mm. like i just don't i don't like it anymore yeah it's more it's there's more like frightening elements around it Mm. that push me away from it right um and to where the 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 neurochemical release itself it seems it seems to be at <clears throat> the expense of a bunch of other things. Yeah, that's my current intuitive assessment of of the thing. So I've just yeah neurochemical release went and and, and like what's the uh, good stuff that you're you're getting that you? Well, let me come back it, to this because I want to close the loop on the original thing here. Okay. Why I've seen my butthole? Yeah, please. <laughs> So my girlfriend at the time, again, because I don't like butt stuff to me, but I don't know what the context was. She was looking at my butthole Mm -hmm. and she saw a mole around my butthole. Yeah. And, you know, moles can be cancerous or a sign of some sort of skin problem that you might need to get checked out. Okay. But she was telling me about a mole on my asshole and I asked her to take a picture for me so I could see it. So she or I think I pulled my asshole apart and she took the picture. Mm. And so I have this really close up pulled open asshole picture on my phone yeah. that I ended up using um, the album, the Cam Boy Smith album, CGM. Oh yeah. You know, it's a dude disc album. Yeah. Both discs are my butthole. Okay. Nice. It looks like it has like this weird, like sort of electric, um yeah sort I remember. of pattern on on the disc right yeah it's the hole is blocking like the whole of the cd is blocking my actual asshole well i was gonna ask you to send me that picture but i guess i already got it though. yeah the, the picture <laughs> the pictures <laughs> yeah a lot of people have that picture uh it just yeah. looks like some cool design but nope that's just my asshole hairs and pubic hairs around my asshole nice um anyway you're going so what was the question you were asking me about the what do I gain from the yeah what do you get out of denying yourself this other thing and what are the the pleasurable things you get is that your phone uh, I hope not I'm on I think I think it is it might be Whatever. I thought I'll put it on leave it alone the airplane mode um so <clears throat> I think that um part of the cultural and world we live in today we have a lot, uh, an excessive amount of access to things that give us neurochemical pleasure and like a lot of it. So these things are like alcohol and marijuana, and nicotine and caffeine and oh yeah, drugs and hypersexualized culture and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, I, my experience has been when I pull away using these things, I call them neurochemical cheats. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's like you're using a substance or an activity just to get that neurochemical release, just to get the pleasure. But the alternative is getting neurochemical release from actually accomplishing things in the narrative that you're living. So, mm-hmm. like, it gives me a neurochemical ple- pleasure to, uh, on a small level, complete a bunch of chores that I set for myself that I have to do today, like cleaning my room. If I clean the room, I get a little neurochemical release mm. from that. Nice. Um, if I have a, a lo- on a larger scale, if I have a long project like that five hour movie, it takes me a year and a half to make, I get a huge neurochemical pleasure when I shoot that last scene or I, I 
click render on the final edit and I'm just mm. watching it and I'm like that this is great a year and a half works done you get a, a very strong solid neurochemical release yeah absolutely and also just you know making progress along the way on on mm. you know small goals within larger goals yeah and um, I think that when you start using neurochemical cheats too much your motivation in doing the natural diegetic narrative neurochemical achievements, it starts to die down or wane or just gets affected. And so the re like there's that to gain. You just become a little more focused and a little more goal oriented and less distracted. But the other thing is even simple pleasures like we're, we're supposed to get neurochemical release from just being out in nature and breathing air and looking at a beautiful tree or a nice flower Mm -hmm. Having a good conversation with someone, having a nice interaction, doing something good for someone else, this little thing. Like these are natural neurochemical pleasures and they all make sense diegetically in a narrative. And I think when you get rid of the cheats, you, mm. those things start to be so much more sweet. Kind of like, you know, someone with a, a standard American diet who's eating a bunch of Twinkies and ice cream and, you know, mm. candy and shit. Yeah. The fruit isn't that enjoyable to them. Right. But when you get rid of all that shit and you eat like just meat and fruit, fruit mm -hmm. is so delicious and it's so sweet. It's like, it's very exciting. And every piece of fruit has such a unique flavor profile. Absolutely. Um, and not just each different fruit, but each, you know, depending on the ripeness and what kind of, you know, where it came from, like mm -hmm. you get, you know, really into the nuanced differences of things. So like, yeah, even the neurochemical pleasures of being out in nature and looking at one flower, you get a different neurochemical pleasure from looking at another flower. And I think that too much neurochemical cheating or even, you know, even something as simple as caffeine, I find to be a major disruptor mm. in being able to enjoy something like a fucking flower yeah. <laughs> or a piece of fruit or a good social interaction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that seems all correct. Once again, we agree. <laughs> Hell yeah. That. I, I would like, you know, I haven't explored this with a partner proper, but just because I, you know, I just got turned on to this uh, idea that semen retention is a, a good idea mm, yeah. at the age of 42. Right. Uh, somehow I escaped my whole life without anybody mentioning it to me. Dude, it's really a fucking... It's it's not a popular thing, and mm -hmm. it makes sense why it's not. Right, it's challenging. I mean, because it is it is our most it's our biggest neurochemical reward, and it's naturally attached to us. I mean, we're like evolution evolutionarily designed to chase it to some degree, mm -hmm. and any sort of idea to voluntarily repress it, not out of fear of God. Because mm -hmm. that's, you know, one maybe. I don't want, I don't know if I want to say it's a toxic way to think about it. Because mm. a lot of people say there's this whole sexual repressive element of organized religion that has really fucked people up. But, you know, and I'm, I don't doubt that it has fucked people up in, to some degree. But also, I do think that sometimes. Like, for example, like blindly believing a thing and acting on that blind belief and fear can sometimes be better than not believing the thing that isn't necessarily true. Like, no. let's say the only reason to not murder people is because God will send you to hell when you die. Let's just say that someone believes that's the only reason you shouldn't murder. And because they believe that, they never murder anyone. Mm -hmm. Where if you took that belief from them... Yeah. Oh, God actually doesn't give a shit if you murder. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, now I'm going to go murder because I don't have another reason. Yeah. And this is obviously an oversimplification, an extreme example, but it is better that that person believes a thing that maybe isn't necessarily true yeah. or they're blindly believing. Yeah. It has a better outcome. Less people are getting murdered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Even if you aren't masturbating out of a fear that you're going to go to hell, that might be better for you. Yeah. 
that might be better for you than than to believe oh i can get away with masturbating all i want well similarly if it's if you're looking at it like maybe not hell but it's uh, an equi- uh, equivalent of like it's going to take some of your life force away yeah yeah oh and i believe then, i believe it on this nuanced way of like we're talking about you know god and Mo- or jesus and moses discovering the real god and the real heaven and real heaven mm-hmm. is a psychological state as the real hell is a psychological state. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. If you masturbate all the time, you are going to end up in psychological hell because you end up in this really low vibratory place of, yeah, scrounging around for the simple neurochemical pleasure. And you're mm-hmm. like a slave to your own sexual desire. You're a slave to that spirit of lust. You're mm-hmm. constantly chasing sexual pleasure that does not serve you in the highest you're not you're you're dispensing with greater goals and your greater power your life force right for for so much less than you could be yeah i'm i'm curious on you know with with a partner exploring Mm -hmm. the as as i've read about as of lately in montauk chi books about uh, maintaining this this life force with yeah. inside of us, and circulating these energies, and being in a sexual partnership where it's like a like a torus shape, like the energy mm-hmm. just keeps circulating between us. And yeah, I love hearing people talk about how during these states, it's a powerful manifestation. Uh, place we can get to where we can we can think about the things that we want to want in our lives and because we're uh, opened with a partner in this loving way mm. they can they can attract it attract it to us which uh, regardless of its truth or not seems like a fun a fun game to play where you're having lots of inward orgasms and uh, maybe outward things that you desire are coming to you as well. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I funny. Michael and I talked about that a little bit on our podcast. Not, not a whole lot, like just, you know, this sort of Taoist idea. And I'm sure it's an idea in other places too, other ancient philosophies, but of the yeah non ejaculatory male orgasm Mm. where you can get to the edge and then, flex Ooh, your pull it back butt muscle in a way to where it shoots the fluid up into your spine. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean that, that stuff that, um, I currently, I mean, I currently really don't have the means to practice that with a, a lady, you know? Mm-hmm. And also like, if you're just meeting someone, mm-hmm. it's not really a, you know, I, I ha yeah, I've had sexual experiences um, in the recent years where I am in one of my little, um, non ejaculatory streaks mm-hmm. and I've had engaged in some sexual acts with a lady and let her know, I do not want to ejaculate mm-hmm. and it's hard, right? It's hard to engage and not come, especially because the further you get into it, the more sensitive and like easy it is Yeah, <laughs> for you to come. Right. And, uh, yeah, I almost feel like you're, um, for, at least for me at this stage that I'm in, it almost feels a little bit like you're playing with fire. Cause I don't know how long you've gone without ejaculating, like what your, what your record is. Can you, do you know it off the top of your head? It's, you know, some, some weeks, some weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my, uh, you know, I'm, my intentions are good. I try to keep going, but sometimes I mess up, you know? Yeah. And I definitely don't like want, think anyone should beat themselves up for not being into semen retention. But I think it's a, a weird niche thing Yeah, as far as comparing people that are doing it to the rest of the world, you know? Mm. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not even a hundred percent sure that it's right in me trying to do it. I, it intuitively. It feels Right. And I'm curious about what happens 
when mm-hmm. I go on a, a, a streak much longer than I have, because I was going to say the longest I've gone is three months, and I've done that multiple times. But where I was getting to is trying that um, non-ejaculatory male orgasm thing. It just seems like you're playing with fire because when you experience what it feels like to be three months into it and then you ejaculate, mm. dude, it's like shooting from a hundred to zero. Yeah. Just like immediately in terms of like your internal energy. Yeah. So it just feels like if you do it wrong, mm. like if you fuck up and you accidentally ejaculate, mm-hmm. I I just I've my experience has been it's not worth it because yeah to ejaculate yeah. yeah but yeah and I also don't um, to go back to the the thing I was saying about like just the me f- finding the pleasure of ejaculating to be kind of empty at this point like it's it's a very brief good feeling yeah and then it's over. And right. I think it's at the expense of wasted energy yeah. in most cases. But I think the exception is when you are really connected to and you really love the person you're yeah. with. And I think it's one of those things that's like, you know, there really might be something to this whole idea of waiting until marriage to have mm-hmm. sex. Because if you, one, truly do that, one of the features of repressing yourself from the orgasm is that feelings of love and lust and attraction are much more coherent. Like when you are constantly shooting your load off, you become attracted to all sorts of shit that you wouldn't normally be attracted to. Right. Your standards are just flushed out the door and you pay less attention to true emotional psychological connectedness to someone because it's just more about the lustful carnal urge yeah. that's guiding you um and, and a quick analogy on that real quick like like cannabis smoking pot there's like kind of this agreed upon consensus it makes so many things better like like art and music you know yeah. you can enjoy a lot of music you would not enjoy sober mm. while you're high and that can be thought of as a beautiful thing. Like, oh, I have this new found appreciation for this stuff that I've put. But then there's also this, if you take it into the context of like saying God designed you to be this unique thing that you are with its own unique judgments and tastes and, and whatnot. Wouldn't, aren't you more interested in seeing what that thing's taste is rather than that thing under the influence of something else, what its taste ends up being melted down into? I know it's probably a pretty unclear way of saying it, yeah. but it's like you're, you have a finite existence. Why would you want to, to, to take something that's going to make you give more of your finite time away to things that otherwise you wouldn't be interested in mm-hmm. if you weren't under the influence of it? Right. And so I think semen retention kind of works in the same way, but on the, the field of romantic love, mm. you know, you're not going to give your time and attention and effort to folks that you're not there with, yeah. that you're not in your most refined <clears throat> form of judgment and emotional and psychological alignment being naturally guided towards or attracted towards. Yeah. You have a refined experience there. I agree. Once again, we agree. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> almost. I, I don't think we need some government contract of, of love to make it happen. But just finding yeah. somebody you love is, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, and you might be right about the, I mean, it, you know, it might be better off that we don't have the government involved in, in like someone that's that's approaching marriage for the reason it's designed for and to, yeah to close the loop on that thought it's like we might be on to something there with waiting until marriage because you when you're finally with someone and you've never experienced an orgasm with but you've chosen each other with the best ability to to make that judgment and it's like the most refined attraction 
mm-hmm. and then you finally like do the thing and get married. You get the government involved and you chain yourselves together. It's like mm-hmm. now we experience the sex. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's with someone you love. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully you hopefully. did it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and hopefully the process of signing contracts with the government doesn't dissolve the love any and uh, right. can only enhance it somehow. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it goes back to that uh, shoe analogy. I think there's something that the government does that protects our feet. Mm. But there's also a bunch of shit the government does that keeps us from being connected to the ground and yeah. getting that electromagnetic anti-inflammatory energy flowing through our bodies. Yeah. That's so such a good analogy. It is feet, <laughs> feet protection, but it's, also yeah, off the cuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also protection from being God. Right. Connecting with God. Yeah. But I just think, yeah, so things like organized religion and government, does allow us to organize our society in a way that makes us as a a larger group able to handle more complex processes that are beneficial to us for our protection and shared social gathering and all that. Mm. But not to say that there's not bugs and Mm. there's not all sorts of elements of corruption and undesirable components to it. It's just, we need to build a better shoe. We need to design the shoe so that it still protects our feet, but connects to the ground. Yeah. 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 And what I think a, that's what, what we're trying sh- to do. What a shoe. Yeah. yeah. Like, do you feel that, and I, and I don't have a, a clear answer for this. I mean, like, I think as far as, um, an issue of like global poverty, mm. you know, there's a lot of people that are really like pissed off about the existence of billionaires and capitalism. And things like that. Yeah. But apparently the truth of the matter is that over the last 50 years or century, even the poorest people on earth are becoming wealthier. Mm -hmm. And just because there's people that are also getting a disproportionate amount of wealth, it doesn't mean that the poor, the amount of poor people is expanding in proportion to the expanding population. Yeah. And, and that their poverty is becoming worse because of the people on the top, you know? Right. Um, it, it seems that a lot of our bouts with disease and our bouts with the poverty and all sorts of problems that we as human beings have always had, or maybe our new problems we do over time get better at solving the problems. So yeah. I guess the the question I was going to say that I genuinely don't know the answer to is like the government we have now, is it worse than the government we had 50 uh-huh. years ago? And uh-huh. and that might be an exception of like, it might be, it might be worse. Yeah. I think, I think it's hard to compare anything involving poverty because just because somebody's poor doesn't mean their lives suck. Oh yeah. Their lives might be way better than, and a lot of rich people. Oh yeah. 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 And thinking about like, I don't know, a third world country or, you know, some place like the place I was living in Hawaii where Hawaiians were, you know, living in um, a situation where they're very connected to, to nature and um, had no, no real desire to have their own beachfront property that is all their own um but you know when america america got there and was like hey here's how it is now now they gotta buy into this money system Mm. Uh, i mean sure i'm sure they had their own forms of trade going on before but now they've got this situation where yeah they've gotta they gotta make money they gotta pay for this house wherever their house is uh they might have been had a cool shack near the near the ocean that they loved but now they're you know got to do something else being an official home yeah and uh but does any of that equate to to happiness Mm. um 
because to me the really really cool times in life has been just the simple the simple stuff of of connecting with nature connecting with my body with other people's bodies and uh it doesn't matter how much money is involved Hmm. in that really it's just about experiencing this this body this experience and this pretty pretty incredible environment that we're in yeah and yeah that seems like the the real the real juicy stuff that's the secret that not not many people are are really knowing about talking about that yeah getting your hands getting your hands dirty in the dirt and uh figuring out uh different ways we can connect with one another like like dancing like singing doing this vocal toning thing we just did Mm -hmm. uh it's like it's all really fun stuff it is yeah you can have a whole lot of fun with without you know any of these modern day resources yeah Mm -hmm. but this is just a cherry on top getting to getting to talk to our through our robot friends here and uh and maybe future gods yeah make this accessible to all sorts of tens of twenties of people yeah (laughs) all tens and twenties and all the you know the the future robots whenever they they take over they're gonna listen to this and maybe they'll be like these guys are all right yeah let's be nice to them thanks thanks future robot gods yeah preach appreciate it yeah Out of all our past creative collaborations, do you have a specific memory or thing that we did together that uh, you like the most? Your favorite memory? Well, I really like... Either the experience or the product of it. I really like being your hype man at rap shows. Yeah. I did enjoy doing camboy shows with you. Yeah. I think I I feel like I I might have. Well, I'm glad you said that because I feel like I might have upset you sometimes when I was. Being, no, no, being, being your hype man. No, and I, you know, I might be a lot better at articulating it now than I was then because I don't think I was so good at articulating mm-hmm. it before, and I was figuring it out working with you because you know I I liked you, I you know you were one of my best friends still are, and I appreciated the fact that you seemed to like cam boy smith and what i was doing with that so much that there were creative explosions going off in your brain and that you felt compelled to (laughs) make an effort to like put these shows together and to involve me in sound walls all those years and all that and so i was definitely enjoying that and very grateful for it and enjoy but you know i think it goes back to the thing that we were saying about um like the note about uh, michael jackson might have done that whole thing with comparing himself to a monster mm-hmm. in the thriller music video without even really knowing what he was doing. Yeah. Could have just been some unconscious intuition him. This is the vision for the video. I don't know why, but right. it's this is the wolf man thing. And then he looks back at the end. Just, I don't know what that's about, but that's what I want. Yeah. And so that's kind of how I've always done Camboy Smith. There's always just been this, you know, I could kind of articulate, at a certain point in hindsight, you know, it seems that I'm, it's some exercise in the shadow. It seems like I'm playing this character that I like to explore the darker parts of myself and people with, you know, yeah. I'm satirizing rap at the same time, darker parts of rap. So it's all these things kind of amalgamated together. Right. But in terms of like, you know, feeling out when making a song or, or presenting the character in a film, playing the character and engaging in dialogue. Um, I couldn't articulate what the character was to someone out. Like, Hey, if you're going to write for Camboy Smith, these are the things you need to understand about him. Like what he does do and what he does not do. Yeah. And it was not a possible thing for me to articulate because I couldn't articulate it, but it is this guided intuition that when I'm making things for it, I can know I have this, internal filter that doesn't need to be spoken out loud like this lyric came to my mind no not that that's not camboy right that doesn't fit this oh yeah that's it 
Yeah, write that down. That's a good idea. Okay, yeah, this is aligning. Yeah, this feels right. Uh-huh. Okay. And even finishing a song. Nah, scrap this one. Mm-hmm. That's not it. I was wrong. Yeah. Or getting to the end, like, yes, this is a very, this is a perfect Amboy song. This is going on the album. This is the song it's starting with. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to make a music video for this song. I love this song. This is so perfect. So <clears throat> I just felt like as much as I liked working with you and like being around you, it seemed like a lot of your ideas about the way that you were presenting this character and a lot of the writing, it, to me, it was just, I don't know why, but it's not right. Yeah. It seems too silly. It seems too cartoonish. It very, it's very much a representation of your sense of humor, and I like it. And I, I think I even said to you at one point, like, look, if you have a film that you want to make where you're going to make up a character for me to play, I would be more than happy to play this character. Yeah. But this is not aligning with like Camboy Smith. Mm-hmm. And I apologize to you <laughs> that we have this frustration where I can't articulate the rules of this character to you. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's just, and, and that's another thing too, about like our, our, uh, senses of humor where I feel like they differ, you know, I know, I feel like there's this pocket of humor that I go to. That's a little bit like, um, like dark and mean and biting. And I feel mm. like you have too good of a heart mm. for it. You know, mm. like I feel like you, you don't, you don't find that stuff funny. I do. I do like that stuff. I, uh, I, I well, the, the, uh, the fuck Jesus Christ video, mm-hmm. I think is a, probably a pretty good example mm. because you're, you're, you're being mean to Jesus yeah. uh-huh. in this video. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's the point of the video. Yeah, it's just over the top un, undeserved cruelty. Yeah. 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 And uh, and my suggestion that I uh, presented to you about that video was... To hug at the end. Jesus hugs you at the end. Yeah. And you don't like it. (laughs) 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 Which which to me would, you know, justify all the meanness. Uh Uh-huh. And and put a nice nice heart on it at the end. Yeah. But see, and and that's a perfect example of why I'm like, no, it has to end with me punching him in the face and he's on the ground and in pain and I'm Uh flipping him off and running away. Yeah. Because that's so, like what you're describing is satisfying Mm -hmm. and it's like, that's a a great little end right there. That makes me happy at the end. (laughs) You know, that's a a cute little joke, you know? And to me, I I think the cute little jokes are like, that's not, that's not camboy. Mm-hmm. This needs to be dark and upsetting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this needs to make you feel gross. And uh, I, well, and I, I appreciate that about that. And I feel like if you did have that ending, mm. it would still have all that, all that meanness, all that grossness. Yeah. yeah. And also alleviate any well i don't want the alleviation that's it but <laughs> but and here's the thing in hindsight looking back on what i do did like about our dynamic what ended up actually happening because i think what our collaborations ended up being was you'd put these efforts into these scripts and these dialogues where you had me saying things and i'm like no nah, I'm, I'm not doing that that's just not right i'm sorry i, I know you put effort into this script but we're not mm-hmm. doing that yeah <laughs> But what we would end up improvising is I would be in character as Camboy and you would be in character as this hype man character that you created. And it had this great dichotomy of me preserving this weird, dark, uncomfortable thing that Camboy Smith is. And then mm. you being this sort of like playing the, the lighthearted, silly, goofy kind of comic relief next to it. Yeah. And I think that in hindsight worked really well. And I'm certainly interested and down to explore that more. And and I I feel like I am in a much better place to where I can articulate things and figure out and and also open to all sorts of different ways of creative process of how we might go about building something like that together where, you know, before I was just very aloof and not very good at collaborating, particularly in the writing process. Mm -hmm. So um, I am very much open to exploring that again. And I think that would be fun to do. And I think we ought to do it. Yeah. I actually have some ideas for live shows. I wanted to present to you that I think you might be interested in. I'll do it off, off the podcast. Cool. Yeah. Cause I, I, I did enjoy how improvise wise it, it shook out mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. Our stage dynamic. Yeah. Like especially the moments, like sometimes they're, they're technical issues. 
And then I would pretend to get like extra angry at yeah. you. And it's like, why are you yelling at this nice man? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like their audience would sometimes get uncomfortable because they couldn't tell if I was like actually angry or not or like what was going on. Yeah. yeah there was just this ele- like this kind of shit show element of are these technical errors like are they on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like I like those as well. And yeah, essentially uh I would I would be happy just dancing up there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I don't have to really say anything, but uh it it's fun exploring that interaction. Yeah. And I I I sometimes I get these ideas in my head. I'm like, okay, let's let's try to plan this out. And it it ends up being kind of a silly mm. uh, waste of effort because you know what is discovered in the moment ends up being better. Ends up well, I don't I don't know if it's better or worse, yeah. but it it works. Yeah, it ends up working. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I you know, and I enjoyed our other collaborations as well, like making making music of a music video mm-hmm. we made together and uh, the short short film stuff. Mm-hmm. The, um, yeah, I think I, I personally I think that can be a lot of fun to keep yeah. exploring. I personally feel like that that scene we did for Zygo is one of our strongest mm-hmm. collaborations. Like just taking our strengths and combining them in a way that the product ended up like it was fun to make, and the product I think it's one of the best scenes in, in any film I've made. Um, and I really like that half of it is script that I wrote, but then the back half where it gets really good mm. is me just giving you just a little bit of direction. But what you do with it is it's so Johnny gray and it's fits into the movie and it just, it, it really shakes it up and creates this like just experience for the viewer that is it's unique, it's entertaining and it's dark and um it's yeah it's uniquely us yeah yeah indeed well yeah let's keep exploring what's what's unique about us and yeah how we can share it with whoever wants to look at it yeah that'd be great well the last question i wanted to ask you on the subject of camboy smith okay i feel like this is a big part of this podcast people come on the show and they talk about cam cam mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't have to ask you anything else if you don't want to. No, I I, I like it. Okay, cool. Yeah. I don't do it with everyone. Okay. only I really only do it with like my friends, my mm. friends slash fans, you know? like yeah. um, Oh, nice word. Yeah. Uh, you know who I learned that from? No. David Gordon Green. The director. Mm-hmm. Meeting him in person. Mm-hmm. No way. When I was an extra on Eastbound and Down, season four. Yeah. I did, I did like 12 days of that. Amazing. Uh, one scene in particular, I am the waiter in like the commissary scene where it's Kenny Powers talking to Ken Marino's character mm-hmm. and they're like getting lunch in Cameron art museum. Okay. I'm just a waiter that like walks by. Yeah. So when I showed up to it, David Gordon green was directing that scene. I just went up to him and checked in with him and I told him, Hey, you know, I'm a big fan of your movies. Pineapple Express is like one of my favorite things of yours. And, I mean, I like uh, much like all of it, and I love Eastbound and Down. And we were talking about how like season two is underrated and mm. that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I love season two. Anyway, and I said like I didn't realize until the other day Tim Heidecker's on this cast this season. Mm. I'm like I'm a huge fan of Tim Heidecker, and he goes, "Yeah, yeah." He's like, "We're friends," you know, <laughs> like because they're both friends with each other and also fans of each other. Yeah. So I was like, "Oh, I like that term, friends." Nice. From a from a David Gordon Green. Mm-hmm. I've got a quick David Gordon Green uh, interlude. Yeah, go for it. Well, it was but weird. we have to make sure we come back to Cam Boy Smith because you know, oh, no. uh, this is your show. I've got to fulfill my narcissism. Absolutely. Well, I was uh, distributing marijuana uh, at, at a time in my life, uh-huh. and it was when they were doing the first season, and I had friends that were working on the the show. And sometimes when I would get marijuana to to distribute, it would have a name that I didn't enjoy, like uh, like AK forty seven or something like that, something violent. Mm. And I would I would change it to 
whatever the heck I wanted to change it to. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I thought a, a good Alien name. Alien scrotum. I, I thought a good name would be David Gordon Green. Okay. Uh, you know, because it's, cause it's green, a green substance. And he was in town at that point. And I'd heard that that particular strand had got back to him. Oh, yeah. And that he enjoyed it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> For the people on the show. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's the that's the word I got. Well, the we'll put the clip on YouTube and see if it gets back to him and he comments and confirms. Nice. That'd be great. Um, so, yeah, my question for you. Uh, I, when I had Mike on, I asked him why his favorite Camboy album is Love Songs for Absolutely No One. Okay. And this is not your favorite. Mm. But your favorite is Michael's least favorite, which is right. I Don't Feel Well, I Need Attention. Yeah. And uh, I know we kind of talked about this a little bit when it came out because you sent me some nice voice memos. But um, if you remember much of that experience, what what is it about that album that stands out to you and that you like about it, why it's your favorite? Okay. I'll accept this Camboy question. And uh, I, I really appreciate that album because I, I feel like it's your most focused conceptually and that the the story that you're telling of your your character is is so clear and the the songs the the exposition of the story how it all unfolds with each song is pretty pretty easy to follow hmm. and you i i get a pretty clear picture of the arc of your character on that album and the yeah the various uh subject matters that are taking on uh and maybe it's because i I know you and i've seen uh what is presented in that album mirrored in conversations Mm. that we've had and what's going on in your life that um it makes it makes it extra extra fun hmm. for me to to listen to and to also uh, just just fi- just feel you on your your plight what you're trying to achieve and notice that in myself as well and able to to identify and uh, when the because the at certain parts in the album because because the album is very different from what you've done mm-hmm. previously yeah by the time you get to a part in the album like come step mm-hmm. where you go back to you've been exploring this new territory musically yeah and then you go back to a song that would be more traditionally Camboy Smith of what you've done previously it's uh which is way deep in the album yeah it's, it's like track 16 yeah <laughs> it's such uh it, it becomes this like refreshing like always oh, getting he's been going through this thing and now he's getting back to his his self his uh his real self which it it turns out you you don't even like because you want to kill yourself a few tracks later. <laughs> and so it's this like cycle of, of life mm. and being dissatisfied with that life and death and rebirth and uh, the striving towards this uh, optimal life, this higher self mm, Yeah, that I, I really appreciate. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> It, and I don't know if, uh, cause I know I talked to you a little bit around that time, but, um, looking back at it, like, I don't know if you know, the production of that album took place like right after I had what I am pretty sure is a psychotic break. Did I, did you know that part? I think so. After a psychedelic experience. Yeah. It, it was more marijuana induced, uh, or at least, you know, it was me smoking marijuana and immediately having a panic attack after one hit, like just several times in a row is what 
convinced me I was having <laughs> right. something wrong with me. Yeah. And, um, and so I don't know. I felt like my life and just my psychological lens, I was viewing the world through was just shocked and like in this, like I was in some sort of metaphysical fetal position, just trembling with existential fear and I could barely operate. Like I was just afraid of the water I was drinking. I was afraid of the food I was eating. I was afraid to talk to people. I was afraid to be alone. I was afraid to be around people, mm. just afraid of everything. Yeah. And I felt just so, so useless and so incapable of doing much of anything. Yeah. And so, and I think that those first few tracks, like especially that first one, it's like some of the simplest, slowest lyrics ever. Feels like I'm dying. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that that was it. It was like, I have to start. Oh, and then the, the second one, um, 23 hours. I got, yeah. You know, talking, <laughs> sleeping for 23 hours. I yeah. think that was the first one I wrote when I was getting back, like maybe a month after just cutting myself off from smoking and focusing on sleeping and getting out in the sun and walking around yeah, you know, like taking it real easy. And then I was like, okay, I think I can handle like listening to some of these beats and figuring something out. And I just remember, you know, finding that little emo sounding guitar track and mm. listening to it for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, walking around my room, putting notes on the, I don't think I wrote anything down on the whiteboard yet. I just, it's something hit me about the joke about, mm. I go to like the, the hook or whatever. Yeah. I go to bed at wait, I can't remember at 2 PM and I wake <laughs> up at 1 PM. Yeah. You know, and then I was just like, and then like when I wrote that hook, I just started laughing my ass off. Uh, yeah. At it. And that was so satisfying. I was like, this is so dumb. This is so simple. And then just, yeah, around, I just started writing these really, I started taking a approach to lyric writing rather than it being, working really hard to write these like really clever intricate bars mm. to be like, no, it's a simple poem. Just trying to express a simple truth. I love that. Yeah. And when I approached it that way, there was, I mean that album, there's I probably have like 10 plus tracks of songs I made for that album that aren't on it. Yeah. I made, so, and it's a 23 track album. I made an excess of mm. songs that just, you know, I recorded rough demos for it and decided, nah, no, this doesn't fit. I don't like this. Yeah. Um, well, each song is, is very focused on its concept. Yeah. Yeah. So I did, I did work extra hard on like, but see, I think it's, it's, I really find it fascinating that you feel that that story is so clear. Mm. Um, because I don't know of anyone else that had that experience. I feel well, like everyone else experiences it abstractly. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, like, the only the only thing I, I think is funny that you find it the most uh, solid and focused and uh, much like a concept album. I find it because I do consider it that, but I feel like Love Songs for Absolutely No One is m more focused because it's literally focused on one person mm. and the exact story that happened between her and I. Yeah. Where this is, this is a little well. more abstract <laughs> and further out. Where like, but I, I find it fat, like, like, kind of crazy that when you sent me those messages back about you articulating like no that's that's very right and i feel like i kind of buried that a little bit under the poetry so it's mm. really uh it made me feel really good to know that even though i felt it was buried mm. and that i experience it that someone else who not only we were communicating a lot no yeah. about a lot of the stuff i'm writing about in there um but that you picked up on it Mm. And that you understood it and that you felt it so clearly. That was that. That's why I, I wanted to hear you yeah. say that. Um, I, and I feel like you're picking up on a very universal thing that's going on right now. This, this answer of, yeah, I'm not feeling quite right, but you know, if somebody pays attention to me, maybe that'll, maybe that'll fix everything. Mm, yeah. Maybe if I get this right person in my life, that'll fix something. Uh, maybe if I you know, ditch psychedelics, that'll fix it. Yeah. Maybe if I kill myself, that'll fix it. Mm -hmm. Just like trying to find 
just grasping at straws to find the answer to how we can feel okay. The whole love pot, like the sort of, um, uh, what's the, the eighties, like retro wave pocket in the middle of the album. Maybe mm. love will, will do it. Yeah. You know, the heart of the album, so to speak. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and going, even going back and forth in those, in those songs of, uh, wanting love, but not wanting it. Yeah. And, oh yeah. It's so, it's so bipolar in terms of what it's saying about romantic love. <laughs> yeah. One track to another. And, and life in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, embracing it and rejecting it also. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, I'm not everybody, but it seems like you're playing with some some pretty well-known universal themes that can yeah. be latched onto. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hell yeah. I had something else about that, but... Oh, yeah. I, uh, you said that... Uh, love songs for no one is focused on one person yeah but i also feel like i don't feel well i need attention is is focused on one person which is you yeah that's true <laughs> that's true but yeah i mean i I guess sorry if you think about this the limitation thing mm-hmm. when it's focused on me as as me well there's so much there that i can talk about myself because i've been with myself for all 27 years of my existence Mm. and all the internal workings of that, right? It's kind of, it's an infinite bottomless pool, but with love songs for absolutely no one, it's about a person externally for myself and my relationship in context with them, which Mm. I hung out with them twice (laughs) during the making of that album. Yeah. And to, to me, I, that's what's so funny about that album is that I did so much with so little. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's something that's, yeah, simultaneously beautiful and romantic about it, but also just like <laughs> sad and repulsive and um, comical yeah. about it. But um, now, now that we're on this topic, I am curious about your creative process when making these things because you're getting... You're getting your tracks from YouTube primarily, yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How how are you searching for these? Is this a big part of like what you're starting with before you're getting into writing the lyrics? Yeah, I almost always start with the beat now. I used to sometimes write some lyrics and then find a beat mm-hmm. for them, but I don't think I've really done that so much since maybe White Devil or CGM. Okay. And what uh, are you what are you typing in when you're all when sorts of different stuff? Like I type in things like keywords um that have to do with the feel. Mm. You know, dark, electronic, uh hip hop, love, you know, it can be it sometimes it can be an artist, you know, like Tyler the Creator, mm-hmm. type beat, Rick Ross, type beat. Okay. Um Kanye, right. not just uh, Yeezus type beat. Oh you yeah, know, like specific to yeah, yeah. The Kanye so album. You can type in all sorts of like keywords to try to find a sound. Like, and I know with I don't feel well. I need attention. I think it was a lot of like alternative rock, um, grunge. Yeah, um, I think with I don't feel well. It was a lot more uh, feel that I was typing in. Right where some of the more recent stuff like working on a sequel to bad boy um and what come comes up is this all fair use stuff or do you come so, across some beats that are just some can't beats use? some beats have free for profit on their label so you can just take them they don't have a tag on them and you can just take them yeah and you can go make money off them if you want mm. um most of them you have to purchase uh you a lease at the very least, if you want to get the tag list. So like the tag you'll hear, you know, someone put the tag in. Like if my name was Dr. Beats, Butt, you know, Dr. Right. Beats, Butt, right. Joint. right. Yeah. You might listen to a little bit of the beat and then you hear this over Dr. Beats, Butt in the house. <laughs> and then, you know, like that just happens like every, uh, little bit on the beat. And so it's like, all right, to encourage you to not steal this, without paying me any money. Mm -hmm. You have to go to my website and you got to give me at least 
20 bucks, 30 bucks usually. That's usually where the range is. Yeah. For a basic lease. And with a basic lease, you're allowed to sell upwards of like 1,000, 2,000 copies of it physically or digitally. Oh, okay. And make money. Um, or have you, have you done that much? That's it, usually what I do. I get the basic one because I don't sell a whole lot of records. Right. Um, you can also go up and get the premium lease where it increases that. Like, oh, it's up to 10,000 now. And you get the tagless MP3 and a tagless wave. Then you can get like the super premium or whatever. And then you get the tagless MP3, tagless wave, and all the track out. So you can adjust the specific like instruments in the beat. Yeah. Take them out, increase the volume, put effects on whatever you want to do. Amazing. Then the highest would be exclusive rights. And that's usually, it can be like a hundred bucks to like 500 or more. Mm. And then he's like, okay, you get all the track outs and it's tagless and you own the rights Mm. to it. You can now sell as many as you want. I can't sell this beat to anyone else. Mm. Um, So yeah, it's usually the free for profit ones are, I get the basic lease. Right. Yeah. It's so interesting that it's, you know, you've got an orchestra at your at your fingertips. Yeah. And so many so many different minds coming yeah. in to help create your albums because yeah. of this, this method of doing, well, doing this. Well, I found it to be um, a really, I really like it because I used to kind of beat myself up about it for the longest time. Be like, ah, uh, I kind of hate that, you know, I'm not making the beats myself or that I don't at least like have a producer who's making them original for me. Yeah. Um, and I want to change that in the future. And I still am interested in making my own beats eventually and, and, and interested in working with producers because sometimes I do. Like, you know, Brian Piccolo has made some beats for me that mm-hmm. I've used. Um, my my friend uh, Aaron, DJ Barbarian, he's done a couple tracks for me. Rainy, you Rainy. know Rainy, he did um, the I'm Not Little Dicky beat for me on, on CGM. Yeah. Um, and he did live musicians with with dave and steve on the no psychedelic song yeah no 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 uh no. dave demiro steve and me and I, I found the guitar track okay I, yeah the guitar track was something i found but you added with them bass, drums and bass drums and bass mm-hmm. yeah yeah dave on drums steve on bass right yeah that was a fun one to mm-hmm. record that live with, right. with them um yeah, I really enjoyed the genre, like expanding my vocal um, repertoire with that album. You know, because like I, I don't think I was a good singer when I made that album, and I still don't think I'm a good singer now. But I think I at least, it at least pushed me to where when I made love songs for absolutely no one, um, I could sing a little bit better. Yeah, I had a little bit more control over my voice, and um, still, it's not great singing on it. But I think it's a lot better than it would have been had I not pushed how, my how do you do it practice yeah practicing I, yeah I mean I record I keep recording takes until I either give up and say I can't make the song the sound good so I'm gonna throw it out there's been a couple songs that have been mm. like I just don't like my singing on this and I can't get it right mm. um and there's other times where like you know running away from love is a good example of one I don't think my singing sounds good on it but it's kind of funny in this endearing way yeah. and it's almost like you can tell what you're going for right. in that track right and I, yeah, you're, you make it you make it there yeah i kind of like the little bit of embarrassing element of being a bad singer but just going for it like ah mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's cool yeah there's a lot of power in that yeah and then also the way that it's reflected too especially some of those early tracks where there's a little bit of singing from me where it's like my voice is timid and shaking, like showing this f- legitimate fear that's being talked about. And it's this major theme that's mm. being worked through in the album. So there's, there's something really poetic and beautiful about being vulnerable enough to be bad at singing and put it out there, which is a lot of what can be said about a lot of the art that I do is mm. it's really unpolished and rough and even kind of embarrassing. Um, to be putting yourself out there like that. Yeah. But, um, you know, maybe it's that element of letting go and not giving a shit (laughs) that, um, seems to be at least one thing I'm doing right. 
Yeah. And the vulnerability Mm -hmm. of sharing that. And that can only serve to inspire others, I think. Certainly inspiring to me. Yeah. I hope I hope so. Yeah. I I definitely like to encourage other creative people in my life, whether they're an old friend or a new friend, like, cause I, I, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit. I feel like there's all sorts of people like friends. I know that just crush themselves under the weight of judgment. Yeah. Like just, it's not ready yet. It's not ready. Dude, you've been, I mean, maybe this could be said about you and the Jesus and Moses thing. I don't know. Absolutely. But, but also I'm not going to say as well as uh, other projects. Right. In right. Life. Of like, just put it out there, man. Like, just get it done. But I also, mm. the caveat there, I do have ideas that I have been working on for a very long time that I'd keep. Yeah. And I'm like, um, my reason is not like, oh, I'm afraid of the judgment or it's not ready yet, but it's more like um, this is a script for a film that I refuse to make this film on an independent budget because it will not be made properly if I do not do this with like a large budget. Yeah. It it can't be done. That right. that's that's the sort of thing. So I'm going to hold and this is I put a lot of work in the script being really good. So when the time presents itself and I can put this in the right person's hands and also have, you know, legal protection on it. Right. Um then you know, that'll be when I attempt to make that thing. But otherwise, yeah, if it's something you can make now, fucking get it out there, man. Right. Don't work forever polishing this thing. Get the thing out there. Let it suck. Hear the judgment. Hear the feedback. Make another thing. Yeah. And take all that experience that you had putting out that thing before. So right. yeah, Unco- it it just you know like I, in in creative writing I was always very like argued with a lot of my professors about the revision process. Because they would beat you over the head with it. Like, it's it's necessary always. Just revise, revise, revise. Yeah. I was like, man, revision's a great tool. But it is, it is not necessary. Yeah. Especially when you're doing stream of consciousness, poetry. Yeah. You know, because you try to revise something, you wrote stream of consciousness poem two weeks later, you're not in it. It's about the raw emotion you were feeling when you uh-huh. wrote uh-huh. the damn thing. Yeah. And so to go back, it's like, yeah, asking chat gpt to rewrite it for you Uh, uh, (laughs) you know that that doesn't know fucking shit about emotion right um (laughs) but yeah and and to me i feel like um rather than take one let's say i'm supposed to write a poem about love rather than take one poem about love and work on this thing for four fucking years and then put the one poem out that's really nice and polished that i thought about (laughs) And revised a thousand times. Yeah. What if instead I wrote a thousand different poems about love and put them all out over those four years, Mm. you know, and odds are more than one in that thousand are going to be something. Yeah. Right. Um, Well, this is very resonant for me because I, you know, work on things all the time that I don't, I don't release or I don't part of it is this idea of it's not not ready but a lot of times I'm, I'm running into an issue where i'm like i don't know how to technologically do a thing that can mm. really make this thing ready and uh i'm not fully focusing on getting it getting it all the way done something else will pop up in my life where i'm like okay i gotta do this other thing now and yeah life just keeps on going but yeah, so having the the focus to really see it through in whatever way it needs to be saw through is uh, it's pretty pretty huge. Yeah, I and it you know it seems like you you put out stuff pretty fast, which is probably uh, benefit to what you're saying about this revision and lack thereof process. Mm. Yeah. And it's not that I don't revise at all. I use right. it. I use it as a tool, but you know, well, yeah. I use it sparingly and I, um, you know, oh, and where I was going with it too, is I think if you get in the habit of not giving yourself the chance to revise so much 
and you just get used to putting out things that you can feel embarrassed about later and have your own judgments about later and just you know know that other people are seeing this embarrassing thing and, and whatnot yeah you're you start to unconsciously process all that and you know what you start to do if you, as long as you continue kind of skipping over the revision process for the most part you just start to try to do it right the first time around mm. you just get better at, at writing things right the first time yeah rather than take this approach of like no just spill out a bunch of dog shit onto the page and you know rely heavily on the revision process to make it worth a damn it's like yeah. no, no no be like put the attention and focus into the writing you're doing immediately mm. the first time. Yeah. And don't waste, don't waste your time. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, that's my temperament. That's my temperament. All right. I don't, I'm not, I don't know that's right, you know, cause <laughs> it may, maybe I'd be doing a lot better if I put out way less things mm. and those things were heavily revised and polished maybe people would like my stuff more. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I am not yeah. speaking from a place of, you know, high horse success. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Well, you know, not to be Mr. Judge about, about your work, but you know, I've noticed some things where, I, and I've, I mentioned this to mm. you before. It was like, yeah, you edit this thing or you know oh, yeah, edit yeah. out this minute long part here or something like that yeah yeah that's always been a temperamental thing too where i'm like no i really like that that minute part i really yeah. like that it's uncut <laughs> like i remember that scene in the chris spike story i remember you telling me uh where like i put the bag on addison's head uh, okay but it's the, the whole trash can scene where like i have him take out the trash mm-hmm. and it's really just this uncomfortable kitchen and date or this uncomfortable scene in dave demiro's kitchen you're yeah. like this didn't contribute to the story yeah. You know, you could easily cut this scene out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I could easily cut it out. But, <laughs> but I really like that there's, yeah. I think, I think there's something very, um, I feel like Lynch, like David Lynch and Quentin Tarantino have all sorts of things like that in their movies where it's like, it's just a, a dumb little scene that just has a emotion that, d- no, it doesn't contribute to the overall thing. But I think that that's um, that kind of thinking, that revisionist thinking of like, no, this needs everything needs to be necessary. Yeah, you know, that's that's a style of doing things. But I think it's less like life right. to have a movie that every every single scene contributes to the thing. You know, I like having a scene that maybe is gripping the audience's attention and they're paying attention to it as if this is an important piece mm. come to find out later in the grand scheme of things. Oh, there was no fucking reason for that. Yeah. You know, that was, <laughs> you know, that even kind of makes the scene funnier. <laughs> it was like, you just made me uncomfortable mm. for no reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, again, I think it just goes back to the temperament thing. Like if that's your style to be a very repo- like polished and revised creator do that because people there's plenty of people that agree with you Mm. but i think when you like uh, and i think i didn't really make this point earlier when i was talking about the the michael jackson thing about him you know unconsciously making a point um like he didn't do that on purpose he's Mm. not trying to yeah i'm gonna slip in here under everyone's nose that i'm a pedophile you know (laughs) i'm a monster you know but uh unconsciously guided through intuition that that's the creative vision and um that's that's completely what i did with that five-hour movie was like you know the last two things i made zygote chris bike story i thought about those things and i scripted them out and you know they have a crescendo and these kind of a a narrative arc and whatever Mm. But I really miss a lot of the really unpolished, like just make it up as you go stuff that I was doing in high school. Yeah. And I want to make a, a, like a large production like that. And so I'm just, you know, I'm going to map things out, you know, just like writing on my own, but I'm not going to take any script. I'm not going to make any scripts. I'm not going to have some sort of organized thing to share with people. I'm just going to be calling on who I need for what day and figuring out what I can get done and what locations I can use and what 
characters I can make with what actors are available. Yeah. And I'm going to let intuition guide me and just piece this thing together. And then by the end of it, you know, I, I had was coming up with all sorts of ideas of what this is and what this means or where is it going. Mm. But I would always catch myself doing it and really just let it go. You don't know. Mm. And I did that because of what I heard David Lynch doing with Inland Empire. You know, he's like, the way that this place works, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm I'm going to piece together these things. And in the end, without me knowing, they're all going to connect in some way. Mm. And it's it's somewhat of like a leap of faith in the way that this world works, the way creativity works, the way the unconscious works. I don't know. I don't know what we're talking about here. Mm. But I think I was like that. Like. I feel that that's right. It's and what I really think it is. I think it's going, it's recognizing how little of us is our conscious mind Mm. and how much of is the unconscious and believing that the unconscious is way more intelligent Mm. and it's going, I'm going to relinquish my conscious organized thinking revisionist mind, logical, connective tissue articulating thoughts and reason and and that kind of thing. I'm going to relinquish that and I'm going to give the creative control to the more intelligent unconscious and I'm going to see what happens. Right. And I think that that was what the experiment was. Let's see what happens. And dude, that fucking movie is one of those things that in hindsight, there's so many things in there that I've connected that are so deeply meaningful that I know I did not consciously orchestrate Mm. did not piece together and it's it's easily the most deeply meaningful piece of art I've ever made and I don't know you know it's deeply meaningful on a personal level but in terms of like something like I don't feel well I need attention for someone else to be able to read that mm. and like articulate back to me oh th- th- this is what it means I don't I don't think it's that mm. um but I do feel confident that if people went into that movie with that mindset of I'm going to openly, I'm going to interpret this abstract piece of art in a way that's personal to me, the viewer. If they go with that open mind that that can be done, I think that they also too will come out with like a lot of really rich ideas and thoughts about just the, the visual and auditory stimulation that is that movie. Yeah. Probably, probably so. Yeah. That just got me thinking about, uh, this idea that, uh, I got turned on to by a UNCW professor, Todd Berliner, Mm. shout outs that, uh, great art is really closer to, to bad art. Mm. That, um, <clears throat> as opposed to mediocre art, mm. you know, it rides that line way closer to, to something that's terrible. And, uh, I like that idea. Yeah. I think immediately I agree with it. It seems to really promote the, the individual being there in their fullest creative power Mm. yeah and uh and now we're at a point where bad good movies are a genre onto itself that people seek out so you can make something like troll 2 and it's considered to be a a classic movie by by so many people that that love it uh specifically because it it does seem terrible Mm. in such amazing ways um, but, but either way, if you're, if you're just promoting that, the individual soul of the art, um, it's going to be something that stands out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that is what exactly the opposite of that is what makes mediocre art is when you have this boardroom of people mm-hmm. trying to, you know, <laughs> make democratic decisions about what is going to sell? What do people like? Mm-hmm. How do we make this understandable and digestible to the widest audience possible? Mm-hmm. That's why you get watered down, mediocre garbage, which I would much rather have, you know, 
Tommy Wuzo's The Room. Yeah. I would much rather watch that than All right. this boardroom decided on middle of the road thing that looks just like everything else released around the same time. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. The promotion of the giving an individual creative control or at least creative leadership in a production like that. And I think too, this was a point I remember arguing in in a creative writing class. Um, And I think it's, it goes to why, because I, you can look at a lot of the things I make and my approach to create a process in writing as a very narcissistic thing, because I'm constantly digging into myself. And, um, but my, my philosophy around that is not that I think I am just so interesting and a deep well of interesting things to pull from and create from. It's, it's that I think that the further and deeper I dig into myself, the closer I get to everyone else. Because the mm-hmm. deeper you go, the more you get into, you know, it's, it's only on the surface that we differ from each other. You know, it's only just our little likes and preferences and our physical features, you know, that's the shit on the surface. Mm. Our opinions on these matters. But when you get deep down into things like love and existentialism and yeah, fear and emotions and, um, our, our natural curiosity about things and attraction and nature and all that like really rich, deeply, human stuff when you dig down into what's super personal for you about that that's where people really resonate (laughs) with you because you attacked a deep thing in yourself that everyone else experiences and um and i think that i i tried to articulate that in one of my creative writing classes of like you know because i think that i was being encouraged to come up more closer to the surface so that I'm more relatable. Mm. I'm like, no, no, no. I think if you go deeper, yeah, you start to get to that really interesting territory or like, I'm not trying to be relatable by talking about, you know, a popular song on the radio that we've all heard. I'm trying to be relatable by talking about this really primal <laughs> human experience that, um, if you pay attention to yourself, you'll, you'll feel, Right. Yeah. Good for you. For Thanks. Standing up for those <laughs> I feel creative like, writing stooges. Yeah. I, I really do feel like I got the most out of, I mean, I enjoyed the film major and I really kind of only feel like I got a lot out of the classes I had with Carlos case. The two I had with him, mm-hmm. I got a lot of really good, like philosophical, um, takes on film, which can be applied to life. Um, you know, a lot of like pulling reality apart through watching avant-garde film and like uh, a lot of this sort of detesting what we just talked about, the boardroom polished type mindset where it's like, no, it's really great to see what these like individual amateur filmmakers do with very little yeah. and they're just taking you on a ride. Um, but yeah, so other like... As far as film studies go, I really feel like I got the most out of those classes I had with him. Plus, you got him to comment on my butthole in your movie. <laughs> so that's a good relationship. Yeah, you got yeah. Going. That was so. That was such an exciting experience for me that he that he asked me if if I had a role available, and that you know it was even his idea to have. Well, the original idea was that both of y'all were naked. Oh, but then he was drunk when he said that. And so then when we showed up to the shoot, I was like, so, so are y'all both getting naked. And he's like, I'm not getting naked. He can though. That's fine. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I like, you know, that's a professor that I really liked and, um, and I'm still friends with to this day, still hang out with and keep up with occasionally. And, um, yeah, that meant, that meant a lot to me that, and also like, there's that, there's that element too of like, uh, you know, this is the avant-garde film professor. Like he's seen a lot of like really cool, interesting shit. And like for me to be able to impress him with what I'm doing, not a fucking chance, 
you know. And so I felt him taking an interest in being involved was a sign like, oh, maybe I am doing something interesting and cool here. And um, that's really cool that he is wants to and is willing to uh, play a role in this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that I, And then also that I can do this with my good friend, Johnny, who they happen to know each other. And mm-hmm. You might even get him to come on this podcast one day. I would like to. I'd like to ask him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. Maybe we can both do it at the same time. Yeah. That I'll, could be, be. I'll be naked and he won't be. <laughs> I'll have you debate COVID with him. <laughs> Just I'll have you debate masks with him. Yeah. He'll wear a mask and I'll have my butthole out. <laughs> Put a mask on your butthole. That'd be good. <laughs> Um, uh, but, oh, but what I was going to say, I got, I got that out of the film studies, but I do feel like a lot of what I got out of the creative writing was s- figuring out what my own creative philosophy is mm. by, you know, getting, um, criticized through some of my work. And figuring out what thing, like, because sometimes people will say things like, oh, I genuinely, I genuinely was not aware of this. Mm. And that's a good blind spot that was just brought to my attention. It was really helpful to see through like just constant workshops, how people generally took the way I would write, how they would generally interpret, oh, Jesus Christ, I can't talk, how they would generally interpret my ideas mm. and what I was saying. And so it was good to get that immediate feedback and see where there was misunderstanding and just how it was interpreted. But those moments where I was criticized for something that like, I just knew deep down, like, no, I have really deep reasoning (laughs) behind this and I'm going to share it with you and try to like when I'm given the chance to respond, Mm -hmm. tell you why this is. And, um, it helped me, find out what I believe through that, that engagement and uh, figuring out these things about me. Like, yeah, I am fairly against revising. Mm. Um, Not all the time. It's a tool you use it, but I think you should use it sparingly. Yeah. Um, It's very interesting. This reflection that we provide for one another and school, it just seems like a concentrated version of that what you're talking about where you've got you know 20 or so other people that are providing this reflection to you on on yourself Mm -hmm. and there's no real other way to get that yeah and to to be able to fully see fully see yourself the parts that may not be serving you or others and to to enhance and highlight the the parts that you feel are serving you and others yeah and uh yeah, that awareness is so valuable. If nothing else yeah. is valuable about school, then that seems like a good thing yeah. to, to stand out. Yeah, that, that reflection <clears throat> of... I mean, you get that just from socializing. Right. And being around people and, and listening to them. You know, it's that give and take with... You know, if people are giving you good criticism that's revealing things that you're truly blind to and it's like helpful Mm. then listen. Yeah. But if they're saying things to you that is just, you know, maybe they're mistaken. Right. And and maybe you're doing something right that, um, they're not, Mm -hmm. maybe you respond and maybe help them if they're they're willing to listen to you. Um, but this thing that you're talking about that, utility of reflection of yourself. I think this goes, you know, we've had these interesting conversations around like monogamy versus polyamory. Mm. And we kind of touched on a little bit. We were talking about marriage earlier, but I feel like Uh that's one of the, that's something I realized in hindsight that I had with Caitlin that, um, I did not understand or appreciate until years later, Mm. but it's that being really close with one person in this idea of uh, reflecting yourself back Mm. because it's like, I would do it for her and she'd do it for me and we would do it for each other in this way. But it's like, you know, you can only get so close with your classmates in a creative writing workshop, but when Mm. you're with someone, 
every day for you know a solid year or more right and you're with each other you know from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed most days Mm -hmm. and you're seeing each other behind the scenes in your most vulnerable and embarrassing sort of moments well then you can really get some keen reflection because it's not just all the things that they're seeing you through but it's the amalgamation of time like just across weeks months years Mm -hmm. and the longer you get the more clear of a picture you have of one another to to give feedback and reflection and get deeper into this thing so you know i wasn't really interested in self-development until a couple years after that relationship Mm. so like seeing a really close monogamous relationship is like a way to develop further for both people that are to share that value that they want that for one another. Mm. They, they use each other's awareness and reflection and that communication to make both of themselves better together. I think that's something that, you know, you can get a version of that with polyamory. Yeah. But you might not be able to go quite as deep. All right. Yeah. And I would think you could only go deep in the situation you're talking about. And, and if, if you got two people that are honest and open. Yeah, that is very, kind of yes, very important that you do it with the right person. And it also that you have some sort of, you can psychologically contend with one another. Cause imagine if I'm really stupid and you're really smart, I'm not going to be that helpful in my reflections and I might not be able to handle the reflections that you send back to me. I mean, I don't understand it. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some, there's some factors that are involved and yeah, especially on, uh, in a romantic relationship like that, where, uh, part of us is, I'm sure has all kinds of desires that, uh, hopefully we're able to share with this person, but you know, that can be tricky if you're desiring somebody else. And, uh, this is supposedly the only person you're, you're supposed to desire according Mm. to the parameters of the relationship. So, and you know, I'm not like Mr. Polyamory guy, but I am curious about, maximizing love Mm, and freedom and and honesty and how that's can all take place in a relationship yeah Uh, whether it's with one person or or multiple people or whatever to to provide these these accurate reflections to each other to enhance our existence yeah yeah i mean i think it's That kind of thing is about figuring out your own boundaries and what's optimal for you and what's optimal for the folks around you with that. Because, I mean, either one of us have a, (laughs) but at least I don't know. I'm not seeing anyone right now, Mm. but I'm saying like, I don't even have to try to figure that out Mm. right now. You know what my boundaries are with. You know, if I were to have a girlfriend tomorrow, you know, how loving could I be to the other people around me? Right. You know, um, obviously I can be kind to people verbally. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. probably can get away with some handshakes and hugs. Right. But cuddling, kissing, Mm. having sex where I come. Mm Mm-hmm. Coming all over somebody. Other people. Yeah. Coming on somebody else's guns. Yeah. <laughs> Coming all over my AR-15 to lube it up. All right. Um, yeah, dude. Well, I'm, I've am i got somewhat of a relationship going on. Yeah. With, um, That's why I pulled back and I was like, oh, wait, no, I think he is seeing someone. <laughs> well, yeah, she's, she's in Hawaii and was thinking about coming here for... A visit. Oh. Um, but she 
a man friend of hers is visiting her right now. And how do you feel? Well, I, you know, there's a part of me that wants to be like, no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, do you feel like you're suppressing that? Um, No, because I I know in my my heart that that's not going to do her any good or me any good, Mm. really. Mm. I'm putting up a fuss about her seeing somebody and I'm not even around. That's uh, that's kind of silly. So, I'm um, I'm supportive. I'm, I'm hoping they have whatever time they need to have <laughs> for their lives. Man, I I respect that you can do that. And that's and that could be you know they fall in love forever and uh, they're they're together forever, or it could be you know they they don't like each other anymore and they're. Yeah. Yeah, they're separate ways. Uh whatever's best for them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, if I'm I'm putting up some fuss about it and that could breed resentment mm. to her from between her and I. Mm. And it's not encouraging her to explore whatever desires she's trying to explore. So I'll be holding back this this person from from being their full self yeah so. no I, I think it's a mature way of thinking about it and um you know i honestly as far as that stuff goes for me i just it's been so long since i've even had to engage with it i have no idea what i would be like yeah all right i have no idea like um feels like a mature stance that you got there well, I'm doing my best, hoping to emulate what I would like to receive. Yeah, because I would like to receive support, love, freedom, yeah, for whatever whatever I desire. Yeah. Well, so <clears throat> here's here's where my thinking goes with again, not necessarily that I disagree with you, but just to be devil's advocate on it. Um, I almost feel like if I were in that situation, my fear would be like, like you said, you have the feeling of, of jealousy, but you're not engaging with it. It's almost like I've been taught that that's how it, it should, I should be well, reacting. So I don't know how much it's been because you're taught or because that's natural. Yeah. And so my my concern would be um on one hand it feel, it does it feels very mature and passive and accepting to go I hope I hope they have whatever time they need to have and if it's good and they fall in love and that's that's great. That's their business. Mhm. It wasn't meant to be. Right? Yeah. And, and I think in a lot of cases that's the way to go. To yeah. to go you know, uh, if this girl reacts this way or she goes off and cheats and does this, then it's obvious it wasn't meant to be. And I can just be stoic about it and just let it go. Mm-hmm. But the other part of me has this concern like, well, maybe if I did act on those feelings of jealousy, not in like a rageful, you know, emotionally erratic way where I'm crying and screaming and kicking and whatever about it. Mm. But, um, being assertive and expressing that emotion and, uh, saying like, Hey, I take the thing between us seriously and I don't want to be with anyone, but you Mm. and you hanging out with this guy makes me feel like I'm going to lose that. And I feel like it compromises our bond. And I don't know if our values are aligned in this. And maybe if they're not, then maybe we should reassess, you know. Hmm. Um, but a part of me feels like that is that might upset you. It might upset her. On the hmm. other hand, if it's with the right person, it might be that expression, the effort you're making in making that expression in voicing that truth hmm. that it does bother you. Well, that might be the thing to make her go, oh, okay, you are this serious. Yeah. 
yeah, he doesn't matter that much to me because maybe before she felt like it's worth exploring other options because you don't seem that serious. You don't see you seem very passive yeah. and not emotionally invested. Seems like your interest is in floating around from one person to the next. So mm. that's I mean, that's that's it is that sometimes when I feel like I am maturing, so to speak, and becoming more passive and letting things go, sometimes I feel like I'm actually sending a false signal mm. to women that I am truly very interested in. Yeah. And making them think I don't give that much of a shit. And then that's the reason they stop engaging with me. Mm. Where like I know I've gone too far on the other end. It's like, oh, he gives way too much of a shit. <laughs> this is overwhelming. You right. know? But I think there's been times where after doing that and, you know, judging the situation in hindsight, go, yeah, I, you know, gave too much of a shit. I was a little too much in that situation. Going mm. to the next thing and pulling back way mm. too much. And then that person goes, yeah, it just seems like he's not there. He doesn't give a shit. All right. And I lose that one for the complete opposite overcorrective overcorrection of the situation. Yeah. Well, I think I think your expression is is very real, very authentic and if that felt right for my situation, I'd definitely express it. Yeah. Um but of course another layer is, you know, she's friends with this person, so they're at least friends. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, to yeah. to begin with. Oh yeah, of course. I do not know all the nuances so, of this situation, and, and not yeah. even saying that you should do this. But I'm I'm supporting you in this it, in yeah, this yeah. Uh, scenario where, and and supporting anybody really is is it's really about the authentic expression, and to go along with that, the non attachment to the outcome. Yeah. Um. Simply expressing the desire is is all we can really do Mm. because we aren't anybody else we don't own i don't own her she's not mine right uh nor we can we own anybody else or really can can. watch me all right (laughs) but yeah it's uh, it's pretty allegorical to controlling anybody's behavior really Mm. i don't like that my buddy drinks too much it's like it's his life. I don't know, what what am I gonna do? Well, this is that's a perfect, other than express authentically. Hey, I'm, right. I'm concerned about you. Well, that's the perfect analogy because think about this. Um, let's just say you and I, with two separate friends, are in similar situations. Let's just say you are the more stoic one between the two of us, and maybe I'm a little more of a emotional and pa- a passionate one of us, right? So. We both have separate friends in our lives at the same time that are bad alcoholics. And, you know, you you tell your friend, hey, I don't really agree with your drinking. I don't think you should do it. They go, ah, fuck you, man. And then they keep doing it. Mm. And then six months later, they die because alcohol poisoning, drunk driving, crash or whatever. Yeah. And then let's say in my situation, I'm like, hey, man, you got to stop your fucking drinking. And they go, fuck you, man. And I go, no, fuck you. And I <laughs> fucking like, we're getting you help. And I set up an intervention and force them. Like, I, yeah, I know that it's your life and your autonomy and you can do whatever you want. But no, mm. I'm not letting you drink yourself to death. Yeah. I we're. it's not just. You know, I think the individual is a really important thing, but Mm -hmm. I also think that there's something to the social network and I'm not talking about like social media. I'm talking Mm -hmm. about like the network that human beings are socially and that it's important to have people around you that are passionate and invested in your Mm well-being when maybe you might be in a place where you can't make that judgment. But, and I think in the case of men and women, you know, um, I know people have all sorts of like undoing these views. They think are cultural constructs, but I think a lot of these things are more biologically rooted Mm. and ancient energetic things like the masculine energy and the feminine energy. And, um, I think there's some element between men and women of like, as a man, you gotta if you you want it, you gotta step up and confidently, 
you know, not force your ownership onto someone that doesn't want it, mm. but, but step up and show that you're serious and that you're passionate about the thing. And again, this could all boil down to a temperamental issue, like being the stoic pas- passive person mm. that's, that's more aligned with who you truly are. All right. And you are that friend that's just accepting and non judging. And that's what you do. You don't get involved. You let people, you let people, you know, drink themselves into oblivion. If that's what they want to do, it's fine to kill yourself. Cause I mean, I, I honestly am probably less like the way I outlined in that hypothetical. I probably am a little more like you or like, look, if I got this person that's doing, I mean, I can think of someone in my life right now that is, was a close friend to me a long time ago. And I know they're on a bad path and I'm really not doing much about it. Yeah. And, uh, I am kind of boiling it down to, well, it's their life, you know, and also admitting to that. It's probably a little more about my laziness and I don't even know what I would do right. to intervene. I like what you, I like what you painted though. That, that picture of this person that's like, no, I'm taking control of your life right now, hmm. which is, I feel like is what's inside me to do. And maybe what's inside all of us to try to take control Mm. of all these situations all these people all these behaviors that yeah. we don't we don't really have control over but we can see and by some grace that it's it's probably going to be a bad situation for right. that person right. or at least that's what we we think because uh, we we know best and uh, <laughs> this uh yeah how how powerful that would be just be like yeah i'm i'm going to fix this yeah and Sometimes you got to do it. And maybe that, maybe that will work or that does work for, for some, some people. And, and I've, I've definitely tried that in ways in the past that, and maybe I didn't do it right because it, it didn't work. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I don't know the right way other than to just state the desire and not have the attachment to it unless because you might not get your way so i don't know what else what else to do really other than being an honest an honest person about what you want Hmm. and I guess it's similar to the manifesting in the universe situation, just stating what you want and seeing if it can come back to you. Yeah. Which would be, be nice. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. But also do we really even know what we want? Mm. Are we, you know, we at least think we know what we want, but it is a fun way to, picture anything that happens as uh the universe giving us what we need Hmm. so you know no matter what judgment we put on it if it's good or bad it's uh it could be it could be a gratitude situation of thanks for this thing that Mm -hmm. is going to give me the, the whatever situation i may need the lesson i may need uh the shift in path that mm. puts us to uh, a whole other, whole other uh, frame, yeah, of existence. Yeah, I love that. I think this has been a really beautiful conversation. We've done well over three hours. I was wondering how long we've been sitting here. Yeah, I think we broke the record. Dang, we'll see how long it is after the edit. Well, you know me. I'm not going to do there very much of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it raw. What kind of ceremony can we use to, to close this out? We got to go visit our good friend, Michael Phipps. Okay. Well, these people aren't going to be along for that. I don't think. No. We could, uh, we could sing to each other again. Want to match tones one more time? Yeah. Which vowel sound? Should we do the U? I'm interested in U. Yeah. The U is the butthole. So that would be good. We have talked about that a bit. Yeah. In this conversation. You. Wow. 
Thank you, everyone, for tuning into the Creativity Theory Podcast. Remember to lubricate your AR-15s with liberal cum. Please. All right, everybody. Night-night. Thanks again, Johnny. Thank you, buddy. Love you. Love you, too.